I dig it. What did Finland ever do to you? Uh, they're in the way. Sorry. Yeah, got off. Got off with Vigatsa. Got off. So what did the update bring? A lot of logistics stuff. A lot of logistics. Novogrod almost is almost done. Oh yeah, no, it's done. Tim Soviet video is out now. Cool. They would not share Hydraulic Press with me. You're welcome to Hydraulic Press channel. Will not share Hydraulic Press with them. The cavalry divisions, man. We're gonna we're gonna need to redo the division templates. All right, this is a good spot to save it up. Okay, cool. All right, guys, let's jump into space news. That was fun. I'm enjoying Hearts of Iron. I hope you guys are too. Um, hope you do better than the historical war. Yeah, that didn't really end too well for them, did it? All right, so I'm going to switch over to the Space and Rocket review. from there. I found a hole in the satisfactory ocean and now under the map. Oops. Okay. I'll be back uh, in... A second here, let me put on a, a, a video here. Let's see. I don't know about oops, but building under the map could be useful. <laughs> okay, I will be back momentarily here. And uh, yeah, we'll get ready for Space News, dudes. See you in a second. Flashing through the sky struck man with a deep sense of wonder.
Even today, man's reaction to a meteoric display is likely to jam the switchboards with reports of imminent invasion from space. But as heirs to the knowledge, disciplines, and apparatus of the scientific revolution, we are familiar with, and at least partially understand, the meteoric phenomena. A meteoroid traveling in space outside our atmosphere remains unseen by man, for the molecules in space are so dispersed that collision with them causes no visible effect. If its trajectory traverses the Earth's atmosphere, it becomes a meteor. Here it begins to collide with more molecules. These collisions become more and more frequent as the meteor descends into the denser air of lower altitudes, causing it to decelerate. Each collision converts some of the energy of motion into heat energy, and the heat continues to increase until the meteor itself becomes incandescent, scribing its visible path through the night sky. Destroyed in the atmosphere by this heating, most meteors present no danger to man. Now and then, one is large enough to survive its passage through the atmosphere to Earth. It is then called a meteorite, and some are very large indeed. Dr. Peter Parameter became interested in meteors early in his career, and once wrote a paper titled, A Thermokinetic Description of Bodies and Passage Through a Plastic Medium of Nonlinear Density at Random Velocities and Angles, which could be just about summed up with this equation. With this equation, his fellow scientists and designers are able to explain the effects of atmospheric penetration on differing bodies, those with different ballistic coefficients, at various velocities and angles. For example, if two bodies of different weights enter the Earth's atmosphere with the same velocity and entry angle, both the heavy body and the light one will begin to heat up at the same time. But impacts of air molecules slow the light body sooner. This deceleration of the light body occurs at higher altitudes, while the heavier, more energetic body penetrates deeper before it reaches peak deceleration. The total amount of heat generated by the lighter one is less than that generated by the heavy one, whose larger mass gives it greater kinetic energy. Two identical bodies with the same velocity entering the atmosphere at different angles also will decelerate at different rates. The steeper angle causes a more rapid encounter with the dense air, resulting in more abrupt deceleration. The total heat generated will be the same for both bodies but peak heating will be less for the shallow entry. With identical meteors entering at the same angle but with different velocities, the faster meteor, under heavier bombardment by air molecules, will have greater deceleration, generating more heat and at a higher rate. But Dr. Parameter is no longer merely an observer interested in understanding the phenomena of meteors. A meteor is just an aimless traveler in space. Doc finds himself now involved in designs with a purpose and an aim. A missile has a target, and a spacecraft has a destination, a journey's end. To these, Doc applies his knowledge. He knows natural phenomena, both of aimless meteor and aimed missile. He knows that as they traverse the atmosphere, they heat up. If the heating or deceleration of a vehicle is excessive, the mission is threatened. Man cannot change the laws of nature, so he must use his knowledge to work within those laws. Doc Parameter knows that the two natural enemies to successful atmospheric penetration are deceleration and heat. He can fight these enemies on two possible fronts. First, on the design front, by modifying the vehicle's shape and size relative to its weight, in other words, its ballistic coefficient. And second, on the program front, by altering the vehicle's trajectory, its velocity, its attitude, and its angle of entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Dr. Parameter is now ready to use his technology to plan a successful re-entry for an ICBM warhead. He knows that of the two natural enemies, deceleration and heat, high deceleration is not a problem with a warhead, but too much heat could destroy it. He first surveys the project on the program front. 
he knows that the re-entry velocities and angles are essentially set by the mission. But to reduce heat load, the velocity of the re-entry vehicle could theoretically be reduced by firing a retro rocket. On investigation, he finds that in order to decrease re-entry velocity sufficiently by this method, a retro thrust system would be required weighing many times the weight of the warhead. This method is out. He next considers the possibility of changing the re-entry angle. He knows that a shallow angle will lessen the peak heat load by stretching the heating over a longer period of time. But the total heat generated will be the same either way, and the vehicle could absorb even more heat during this longer re-entry. Furthermore, a shallow re-entry angle has other serious drawbacks. First, a shallow angle impairs accuracy by deflection in the atmosphere. Second, it affords more time for enemy interception. A steep re-entry improves the missile's chances of avoiding interception and of reaching its target with minimum atmospheric deflection. In this case, altering the program is not the answer to the heat problem. Dr. Parameter must attack the problem of heat on the design front. Logic would seem to indicate that fast travel requires a streamlined shape to slice its way through the air. At subsonic velocities, this is true. But at supersonic speeds, the moving vehicle displaces air molecules which bounce off, forming a shock wave. As speed increases, the shock wave becomes more severe, and heating increases. An ICBM will have a free-fall re-entry speed in excess of 23,000 feet per second. At this speed, the heat of molecular collision and friction, shearing of air molecules, is concentrated in a narrow zone along the surface of a streamlined vehicle. The heat generated may cause the temperature to exceed 15,000 degrees Fahrenheit. To combat this terrific heat, Dr. Parameter designs instead a re-entry vehicle with a blunt frontal area. The blunt shape creates its shock wave somewhat ahead of the vehicle. This occurs because the atmospheric molecules colliding with its frontal surface bounce back and intercept others coming in, setting up a kind of picket line in advance of the warhead. The peak heat is generated in this area, away from the surface of the vehicle. Although the blunt shape decreases the peak heating of the warhead to half that of the streamlined shape, it will still heat up to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit, much too hot for unprotected warhead structures. To further reduce heating, Dr. Parameter must find other techniques in addition to the blunt shape. His first solution is the heat sink. Use the blunt design and add a mass of heat conducting metal large enough to absorb most of the heat generated during re-entry without melting before impact. It works, but he is not yet satisfied. The weight of the heat sink displaces more than one-fourth of the payload. Furthermore, the blunt design slows the missile, keeping it in the atmosphere a longer time, making it less accurate and easier to intercept. For the greatest accuracy, and shortest time in the atmosphere, Doc knows that the streamlined shape is the best, but the heat sink cannot absorb and distribute the sudden extreme heat generated during the re-entry of a streamlined vehicle. Doc reasons, if the heat cannot be absorbed, why not eject it as fast as it's generated? The answer is ablation. Ablation! Coat the frontal surface of the streamlined missile with layers of ablative material composed of fibers, resins, and ceramics. This ablative coating protects Obviously. the missile from the extreme heat in several ways. It is a poor heat conductor. Its surface gradually melts away, taking heat with it. And its vapor forms a thin insulating layer, deflecting some of the heat from the surface. The ablative principle combats the heat problem effectively and permits steeper re-entry angles while adding a minimum of weight. The streamlined missile, with its increased speed, affords the least possibility of interception and the greatest accuracy. It does produce a huge deceleration factor approaching 150 Gs. 
Fortunately, this poses no threat to a warhead. But for manned or other recovery missions, the G-load is a most important factor. For manned re-entry, this force should be held below 10 Gs. A shallow re-entry angle of about 1 to 5 degrees is the simple answer. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the shallower the angle, the less the G-load. Four. But this will be sustained over a longer period of time. This means a longer time What's at high saying? speed through the friction of the atmosphere. Let's take a moment to see why this is not desirable. Dr. Parameter? Thank you. Now, gentlemen, we have here a kettle of water. Heathcliff, we can use you in this experiment. Oh boy, an experiment! Thank you, sir. Now, if we may have another kettle of water and your stand-in. Thank you. Now, we'll proceed with the experiment. Experiment? We'll add the same amount of fuel under each kettle, but alter the form of the fuel under one kettle. Listen to this. This is important to understand. To make it burn faster. We ignite both at the same time. And compare the results. Splendid. And I'd like to point out that the fast-burning fuel, although reaching its intensity quickly, exhausted itself quickly. The heat absorbed was negligible. The slow-burning fuel, on the other hand, gradually increases in intensity. It will generate the same total heat load, but over a longer period of time. And you'll notice more heat is absorbed. Thank you, Heathcliff. Thank you, Dr. Parameter. So although the peak heat generated in the shallow re-entry is less, the capsule is in the heating regime for a longer time, and without the utmost protection would absorb... How I explain this, guys, is... This is barbecue slow cooking right here. That's flash frying right there. It's like cooking food. Same exact concept. Same amount of heat energy over time, just... All of it at once, or all of it over a constant period of time. This is the difference between how a nuclear warhead comes back in and how a capsule or a space shuttle comes back in. Of an intolerable amount of heat. For manned reentry, Dr. The Parameter fire. overcomes the deceleration enemy through program with the shallow angle. But he must combat heat exactly. on the design yes. front. A blunt shape to cause a detached shock wave a picket line against heat, and ablative materials for additional heat control. The doc is confident his new design will fulfill the requirements. Now to try it out. He wants low peak deceleration, so the shallow re-entry path is mandatory. This brings him down safely, if a little off target. To achieve some control and accuracy as well as safety, Dr. Parameter has been working on other design concepts, particularly shapes that produce lift. He knows that a ballistic missile is designed and programmed to hit a particular point on the Earth's surface. A manned ballistic vehicle with the same objective is much less accurate due to its design and long shallow penetration. But a lifting vehicle, which is capable of descending at a still more shallow angle and with an extremely low deceleration rate is able to change direction. This control gives it wide selectivity of landing sites with a large footprint area. For the shortest range within the footprint, the vehicle is pulled up into a maximum lift attitude at re-entry. This induces maximum drag, causing a steeper, more abrupt descent. For the longest possible range, the vehicle must assume the attitude of maximum lift over drag ratio. This footprint, huge at first, shrinks gradually as the vehicle descends. Dr. Parameter, Literally while considering the advantages of lifting vehicles, is also aware of their drawbacks. First, the lifting structure itself imposes weight penalties, which compete with the all-important matter of payload. Then. Lifting vehicles may also spend up to 20 minutes in the heat regime, and being more streamlined, they require a still more complex heat protection system, competing still further with payload. Dr. Parameter, with his associates, has studied the strategy of atmospheric penetration. He knows its natural enemies, 
deceleration, and heat, and has met them on the two fronts of program and design. He has accomplished important objectives. For the intercontinental ballistic missile, the objectives are rapid atmospheric penetration and accuracy. The warhead's natural enemy is sudden intense heat. Its program, high velocity, steep re-entry. Its design, streamlined with ablation to combat sudden heat. For a manned or other recovery mission, the objectives are, first of all, safety, and then control. The mission's natural enemies, high deceleration, sustained heat. Its program, shallow re-entry for low deceleration. The vehicle's design, blunt, yet with control capabilities, a maneuverable lifting shape. The resulting long duration within the heat regime exacts a weight penalty because a complex heat protection system is needed. Trials! There will always be problems to solve. Dr. Parameter has worked out successful compromises so far, but he is still puzzling, still exploring. He plots his graphs, his curves, and flings them boldly into space. But he knows that we have barely gotten our little toe into space, and he constantly seeks to improve that toehold. He must hold to the possible, yet he constantly works along its impossible edges. He has opened the way for man's safe re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Journey's end for space travel. There you go. All right. Welcome to Space News. All right. That's really cool. That that actually goes through all the different principles that different vehicles use for reentry. Uh, Dragon uses an ablative heat shield, just like that. <laughs> the, 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 the physics doesn't change much. Starship is going to use something that's more like the shuttle that they made, but it's kind of like halfway between capsule and not. But did you guys see an important thing to understand in that video is right here uh, how that plasma knife works. Uh, let me see if I can find it. This part right here. Check this out. So the reason why reentry vehicles, capsules, space shuttle, whatever, have such a blunt shape, and this is the re this is the reason why the shuttle flies like dog crap down here, or why it didn't fly very well down here. It flew just good enough to be able to land, and that's about it. This is the reason right here. See this? You, if you have a tip warhead like this, the theta angle of your hypersonic boundary layer. So this this right here, that white line is a layer of, it's basically a trail of plasma, okay? So, the idea is that you want something for hypersonics that's going to be blunt, right? Just like the video said. Because the closer that your theta angle is, so the faster you're going, the closer this theta angle is to your vehicle, this gives off an incredible amount of heat. So, the blunt shape, like this, actually compresses air right here, up against the heat shield and there's a medium between plasma accumulation right and the actual surface of the heat shield that's something that's really important to understand the heat shield is not actually touching plasma it never does it never touches the plasma the plasma is near it it accumulates kind of in front of it but there is a buffer line of compressed air molecules in here kind of like a similar concept to like a hovercraft you know hovercraft how it has that air cushion underneath it same exact idea but when you're going this fast you don't need an air cushion you don't need a th you don't need a skirt the air just stays there and it gets compressed there and it doesn't move and then plasma accumulates right here in 
setting up a kind Which of is picket. Really important to understand. That's really huge with reentry. That's it's a real big thing. See, it makes that the plasma accumulates actually a, like a couple of inches away. And anybody that knows any anything about heat, that a couple of inches is good enough. And the resulting heat given off by the plasma melts the ablator, and the ablator outgasses and it gives a it film cools the outside of the capsule there's a cool layer of gas that gets pushed off to the side and outside of the capsule supersonic retro propulsion literally does the the same thing ssrp with falcon 9 does this only it fires the rocket engine instead of using an ablative heat shield which is really really cool it's really interesting to understand that's what peter beck was talking about with that plasma knife that plasma knife down at the bottom of Electron is a it, Electron is light enough, so it's not going too incredibly fast. And because because it's so light, it weighs the vehicle weighs one ton, so 2,200 pounds when it's when there's no fuel in it. Because with parachute and everything, because the thing is so ridiculously light. If you go back to that formula here, all right, right here, the surface area over the weight of the vehicle, right. And then you have pressure and velocity, and then your theta angle right here. So the angle of that plasma knife will make it. it it'll be. It'll. It'll survive reentry. It'll survive reentry a lot better. The plasma knife is actually outside of electron shape. The the way electron is shaped, the the first stage, that that plasma knife goes out and away from it. The angle is very very low. You have a very low sine angle when you're not going fast. When you're going fast, the theta. So that that's the difference between you know, the velocity that you're going uh, and the angle of the, the hypersonic boundary layer here, the angle in here, that's your theta. You can get, there's a higher sine theta if you have a blunter shape. So that means the knife gets shot off to the sides. That's something that the space shuttle's nose cone does. The space shuttle nose cone does exactly the same thing. And fortunately, because Electron is so ridiculously light, it doesn't have a lot of momentum, so not as much air gets compressed up against it, so the theta angle of that hypersonic boundary layer is enough to go around the vehicle. This is why Electron can survive re-entry like, without much heat protection. It just needs a couple of things here and there. That's what Rocket Lab found out with their first stage. They figured that one out. It's making it through re-entry, just because the thing's made out of carbon fiber. It's so ridiculously light that it doesn't really heat up too much and the 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 theta angle of your hypersonic boundary layer is going over here somewhere it's kind of more like uh let's see let's see let's see where do they show it kind of more like this only there's rocket nozzles right here same thing for the payload fairing yep Came here, same exact thing. That's how SpaceX figured out that they could get their payload fairings back. The payload fairing is so ridiculously light, uh, it doesn't have a lot of momentum, and it has a very high coefficient of drag. A lot of surface area exposed to oncoming air. That's what coefficient of drag is. It's if you're looking at something from the front, how much air is? What's your surface area is opposed? Like, what's the surface area of incoming air of laminar flow against that object? You could the fairing has a has a very, very high coefficient of drag, and because it's very light, it has a very low ballistic coefficient. So it doesn't have a lot of momentum. It kind of, it's kind of like if you threw a piece of, like a paper airplane off the top of a skyscraper. It'll just kind of, it, it won't nosedive to the ground, but if you made that same paper airplane out of like metal, you went to throw it, it would, it would go right towards the ground. How much momentum the object has is very, very important to understand with reentry heating as well. I wonder what would happen with that new boundary layer formula at those hypersonic speeds. Well, yeah, I don't know. Does the fairing have RCS to keep it from not flipping out of control? Yes. Yeah, T-Man. All fairings have, have a pneumatic system in them. Atlas does too. Not for reusing the fairings. How do you think they separate the fairings? How, where do you think that velocity of the fairing separation is? How does how do they get that? Where's that force coming from? It ain't from a spring. A spring would just go like this, and the fairing would close back together. Most fairings use a pneumatic system. There is compressed air inside of the fairing, and then they have a jet, two jets basically facing each other at the top of the fairing, and it. Psh, that's how they get the fairings to psh, shoot off to the sides. All fairings have compressed air. SpaceX just said, well, okay, instead of just compressed air to separate the fairing, 
why don't we give it a little more compressed air and give it an attitude control system so the fairings, when they separate, they reorient like this and they fall down through the atmosphere. Give it a little extra compressed air and a, and a small parafoil and you can get them right back. Smart, man. Uh, that's really, really interesting stuff. And that atmospheric reentry thing has a lot to do with it. Here, you want to see what that looks like? Watch this. So there's the separation, right? Watch this. The COPVs for it are down here on the fairing center of mass. You can see three of them down there. Look at that. There's your hypersonic reentry effects right there. That's a real picture. Look, check it out. See these sparks up here? That's the plasma boundary layer getting too close to the nose cone of the fairing. The, the knife gets really close to the nose cone because it's the, the nose cone is pointy, right? So the plasma is getting way too close to it and it's burning the paint off. That's what those sparks are. That's why SpaceX ended up putting a, a heat shield, a, a small, like, I don't know if it's metallic or what, but on the, on the nose cones of the fairings, they put an extra, they, they beefed it up. They put more TPS up there so this stuff doesn't happen. See, that, that, that layer is getting way too close and it's burning the paint off the front. The paint's acting as an ablator. See that? Is that righteous or what? Is it hot inside the fairing? No, not really. Once again, it's the fairings are very light. Guys, the, the blue. This is blue flames. These are this is not very hot reentry comparatively. Like it's really not. But they do they do experience some reentry heating. But this is this is really I know it's blue. It's, it, this is not very hot reentry heating. You're not it's just a cool effect. Also, an interesting thing to note here is that there is some plasma coming through. There's some plasma coming through the fairing positive pressure vents right here. See that? See it coming through? I mean, Supercraft, it's probably, I mean, I don't know. You probably could ride it down if you had a spacesuit. It would probably be one hell of a ride. Uh, I mean, I don't see why you couldn't. It probably, I mean, in vacuum, heat can't transfer. You know what I mean? So, but the reentry heating would probably heat the fairing up a little bit, but it's enough to keep the acoustics, the acoustic sound deadeners for the payload intact. So I'd assume, yeah, probably, it'd probably be fine. New sport fairing riding. It's more like fairing surfing, but yeah. So people have asked what's inside a fairing. Well, here you go. Oh. Yeah, I mean, Goalie, you're looking at part of the pneumatic system. Yep. There's your RCS right there. And then there's the main separator. See, it's just a, it's just a pneumatic valve on a solenoid. That's it. This is all, see this, all pneumatics right here. And then there's the electronics to control the pneumatics. These are, these are just, these are pneumatic valves with an electronic solenoid. Like what you'd see on a nitrous tank. Same thing, literally the same thing. In fact, I bet you it's off the shelf, if I had to guess. Would the reentry plasma have been visible from the shuttle cockpit during reentry? Think about it. You tell me. What do you think? What do you think with what you know about boundary layers and hypersonics, Sile? Do you think you can see it from the nose? Has fairing reuse paid off or no? Yeah, short line, I would say. Fairing reuse isn't, wasn't implemented with Falcon 9 because they're trying to save money. It's, the fairing is actually not particularly expensive compared to the rocket. Fair, to make a fairing, it's a couple million. Right? It's not that big of a deal. Comparatively to a $60 million rocket, right? Or like a $20 million first stage. That's that's marginal. It's nothing. They reuse the fairings because fairings take a long time to make. 
They're a production bottleneck. That's why SpaceX did fairing reuse in the first place. So yes, I would say it's paid off. In order to achieve the high frequency of missions that SpaceX wants to do with Starlink, reusing fairings was a, was a must because they can't make them that fast. You need to put them in an autoclave, which is a big, easy bake oven at high pressure for fairings. Slightly visible as it goes off to the sides. Well, remember, we're working in three dimensions here. It's not two-dimensional. You're not thinking fourth-dimensionally, Marty! Here, I'll show you. Look at the hypersonic testing picture. What do you think? Think you can see it? Artemis 4 hardware. Oh. Oh yeah, you can see it. It's hard, to, it, it, it's weird. It looks weird from this angle, but you can see it, absolutely. How much is a sat like Starlink worth approximately? Trying to understand the price scale. I don't really know hypersonics, to be honest with you. Um, so here, there's a... It just kind of glows. They're look at, see the boundary layers right there. You can physically see it. It's that orange, but it's out in front of the cockpit. So it just looks like, it just looks like an oven. That's it. See what I'm talking about? They're looking at the boundary layer, the, the hypersonic boundary layer that's coming on the wake. The, that's the, that's a plasma wake right there, but it's a, it's a couple meters out in front of the cockpit. So that's what it looks like. It's cool, man. That's really, really neat. I mean, keep in mind, the shuttle is like this. This this picture, you'd think like, like how our brains kind of work, you think the shuttle is like this, right? And re-entry is coming at it this way. In reality, relative to the ground, the shuttle in this picture is probably somewhere up here. And this camera is literally pointing up in space. And what you're seeing is the boundary layer going up over the top. Yeah, of course you can see it. But it's not. it doesn't look like how you think it looks because it's a little ways away. Now you compare that with the Orion capsule and that, speaking of that, Nova's just linked this up. Take a look-see. Oh, that looks like a heat shield, boy. That looks like a heat shield right there. And that looks like a super guppy too. Yeah, let's see. Hey, all right, all right, okay, okay. It's a Chevy, but I'll take it. That's cool. Artemis 4 heat shield, huh? Nice, nice. Here, check this out. This is from the EFT-1 mission. This is what it looks like from a capsule. This is on the back side of the capsule looking up. So the capsule's going this way. Heat shield's this way. That thing that I just showed you. But this is from the EFT-1 mission. Check this out. So what you're looking at is the, the, the plasma trail that's going around the capsule. Off topic, I had this discussion with a friend. Do you think people living do you think people living in mostly sunny places all year are generally happier people? Seasonal depression's absolutely a thing, Eagle. So what you're seeing here is the gases that are the ablative gases that are exhausted by the heat shield. That's what this is. So this is looking from the docking port, precisely. Mm-hmm. Look at how the ablative vapor, the ablative gases kind of propagate. So like the capsule's going this way. This camera's pointed that way. Capsule's right here. Pretty crazy, right? Yep. See the gases are getting a little bit heated because plasma. I don't know, man. Eagles, you know, okay. Well, I got to read that Artemis article too from NASA Spaceflight. 
we haven't dived into that Phil Sloss article, Novus. Let's we should do that now. We should do that today. Uh, the Pritzel mod, Pritzel module also launched this morning, which is pretty awesome. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Where's that Artemis article? I have it here. I don't know, man. I, I think it really depends on the person, dude. You know, I, I will tell you this. Seasonal depression is absolutely a thing. Uh, in Boston... So, like, a lot of people don't like daylight savings time, right? Everybody says, oh, daylight savings time is a big pain in the butt. It's a big pain in the butt. Why did we turn the clocks back? Dude, if if Boston didn't have daylight saving time, the sun would go down at 3.30 in the afternoon. I'll take my daylight savings time. Thank you very much. So... I mean, I don't know about you, dark at 4 o'clock, no thank you. Yeah, even getting dark at 5 o'clock is not okay. Uh, like, I, I really don't like it. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, I, I think it really depends, you know? It really depends on the person, dude. Are there any plans on how to remove space junk from orbit? There are plans out there, App State. Yeah, guys, it's it really depends. Like, I don't know. Some people like the season. Some people like the warm weather. Like, me personally, I like warmer weather. Like, I like Florida, and I like, you know, California and Arizona and New Mexico and those places and Texas and stuff because it's, you know, especially like California and, you know, Arizona and Nevada, it's very dry. There's not a lot of humidity, and it's always sunny, so cars don't break. For instance, you know, um, but I mean, Florida cars rust like crazy because it's so damn humid, right? But I'd still like Florida too. I generally enjoy nicer weather. I like, I, I'm gonna, you know, as much as I, you know, like, oh, you know, we're a big smart rocket man. I, 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 dude, as much as I don't want to admit it, you know, getting up in the morning and having it be a cloudy and crappy overcast day does affect my mood a little bit. It's just like, oh, great. Another rainy day. Lovely. However, there are people that live in Portland, Oregon, in Seattle, Washington, and up in the Pacific Northwest where it's like that every day and they love it. So, who knows? I don't know. Hawaii, say bye-bye to your clear coat. Yep, the sun will literally melt your paint off of your car in some of those areas. Yep, yep. Working from home has its benefits. So, I, you know, Eagles, it really comes down to the person, dude. It really comes down to the person. I don't mind the seasons. I hate snow because it wrecks my car. And it's a pain in the butt, and it gets everywhere. It's coarse, rough, and it gets everywhere. No, um, it, it, you got to shovel it. You got to move it. You got to clean off your car. It's just another thing to freaking do. It's a pain in the butt. But, you know, some people like it. I mean, I don't, snow, I don't let snow bother me. It's just annoying. That's all. I mean, that's that's all. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't make a generalization like that. Like, oh, warm people in warmer weather tend to be happier, blah, 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 blah. Nah, I don't think that's right. I think it really depends. It really depends on the person. Everybody's different. It, it probably would be prudent to not make a generalization like that. So this combo got me thinking. I'm actually not sure when I saw the sun last. A couple of weeks ago, maybe? I mean, for what it's worth, Laser Man, I am I wake up at noontime and I get right to work. I don't really see the sun either. I really don't. I'm happier in cold weather and you live in Texas. Well, what's cold weather to you, Reagan? Do you want 32 degrees Fahrenheit with zero humidity and a wind chill? You know... Uh, okay, have fun with that. I live in a city where it has the most sun hours a year in Europe, so a little rain isn't that bad. Yeah, I find that people that live in sunny areas want cold, and people that live in cold areas like me generally want more sun. And so I guess it kind of comes down to the person. I, I, I still really don't like snow, but as I get older, it's just like, meh, alright, whatever. It's kind of cool, it's something different, I guess. 
when I lived in Florida from 2006 to 2008 when I was down there it was literally sunny and 70 all the time except in 2008 there was a heat wave so it was it was like a, like 90 degrees all the time it was really warm uh but you know I didn't mind that either because every day you could go out and do something just wake up with a sunny day is just nicer you know I want 65 in the morning and 75 in the afternoon every day all year. So North Carolina, Jason. Yeah, it's grass is greener, Eagles. I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah, there you go, Juice Pot. Uh, yeah, I don't mind the seasons as I get older. The sun going down at 4.30, though. God, does that suck. Like, guys, it's, it's dark out. It is pitch dark out outside right now. It's 5.30 in the afternoon. Pitch dark. Not like not sun going down. It's dark, like nighttime. It, like the amount of daylight we have now is the amount of daylight that you'd get at midnight. It's dark. That's it. Because Boston is so ridiculously far east compared to uh, everything else in the U.S. It, yeah, it is pitch black outside. It sucks. It's not fun. Yeah, James, there you go. Ohio here. I'm with you. This 1730 nearly pitch blackout is the worst, right? Yeah. Are you guys getting snow Sunday night that we are getting? I don't know. I think I'm too close to the water, Canuck. It might it might snow a little bit, but it won't stick. It's going to be literally the first time that Tough Enough sees snow ever. I'm not looking forward to that. Summer coming in Australia. Time to move there. Yeah. Anyway, all right, let's get into this Artemis production article here. This is where we'll start off space news. This is a NASA space flight article coming from Phil Sloss. All right, let's see what's going on with Artemis. With that, you don't have those welded gears anymore. Yeah. yeah. Maine is nice, Eagle. It's quiet. It's quiet. It snows a lot up there, though. Yeah, Crafter, you know. You know how it'd be. Victory's like, I haven't seen snow in seven years. Well, aren't you special, you jerk? We all can't live in freaking paradise like you. I like San Diego a lot, Victory, for what it's worth. San Diego's nice. You know, like, I suppose if I, like, if we move to San Diego right now, right? If I move there. I probably eventually would miss seasons, but yeah, that wouldn't be for a very long time. Yeah, that wouldn't be for a very long time. Cause you know, you can't screw with you can't screw with Sunny and 70 every day. It's great. Pro tip, don't. Too expensive. Yeah. Victor, remember I got I got family in Ramona. One of my uncles is out there. Yeah. I, I don't believe me, I know how expensive it is. Don't move here. I don't want to. I don't need to do that. Family. 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 All right. Anyway, let's read this article. So, the arrival of the second European service module at Kennedy Space Center in October signified the beginning months of the final assembly of the first crew Orion spacecraft that will fly four people on the Artemis II mission. Following the delivery of the ESM from prime contractor Airbus Defense and Space to Orion prime contractor Lockheed Martin, the two primary elements for the Artemis II Orion service module are now being bolted together. Lockheed Martin is processing the Orion flight hardware for Artemis II and Artemis III as part of the assembly test and launch operations in the Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at KSC. As they process the Artemis II Orion and crew service modules to be mated next year, the Alto team also received the next crew module pressure vessel and is also simultaneously building up the crew and crew module adaptal structures for Artemis III. Sweet. Standalone build up for Artemis II modules. Following the completion and production at the Assembly Integration and Testing AIT facility in Bremen, Germany, Airbus delivered the ESM Flight Model 2 FM2 to KSC in mid-October. Alternatively, 
referred to as ESM-2, the, after the module was received in the ONC building, it was tested following its overseas air transportation to make sure it was still ready to be mated with the crew module adapter for Artemis II. We performed something called the TIC, which is the Transportation and Integrity Check, said Lara po Polia. Polia? Yeah. Orion test lead engineer for NASA, said in a November 5th interview on the floor of the ONC building. After having traveled all this distance, we make sure that nothing has changed significantly after the transport and everything is good, good to go before you put on the crew module adapter. Yeah, caveman, yeah, maybe. We did, thing, we did things like check the pressures of all the tanks, check to make sure all the valves were in the correct states that they were supposed to be in for systems like the propellant system, and we check to make sure from an electrical perspective that all harnessing that is going to be connecting up to the crew mating adapter has the right resistance and continuity associated with that. I'll break out the multimeters. So we check all those things individually to make sure that that when you do that, the connection, the connection there is not going to be like, say, electrically a transient spike that harms the CMA from that perspective. See this kind of outer ring right here? That's the crew mating adapter. This cylindric section here is the ESM. So it's this white piece right here. The ESM is this part right here. Crew mating adapter, or it, crew mating adapter mates the crew module to the service module. It's the adapter that kind of cradles Orion's heat shield and Orion. We do all that beforehand, and once we completed that, then we gave the go-ahead to then go mate to the CMA. At the time of the interviews on November 5th, the CSA and the ESM have been positioned in the lift station in the operations and checkout building and bolting the elements were underway. Right now, we're doing structural physical mating, so that's bolting all the longeron bolts around the perimeter. Also, the bulkhead bolts between the CMA and the ESM. There are 192 bolts that have to be installed, and so I believe the bolts are loosely fit in initially. Yep, 120 of them, and they're just now starting to tighten and torque them down. Yep, you gotta make sure all the, you gotta make sure that capsule is centered. That's what piloting dowels are for. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure there's one on there. I'm sure there is. The CMA and the ESM are two major elements of the Orion service module. After they are permanently bolted together, the newly integrated service module will move from the lift station to the operations and checkout clean room. That is the next stop. After the structural mate, it comes into the clean room where we then do the welding of the fluid lines between the CMA and the ESM. The bolts are in the pudding. <laughs> Some of them are mechanical fittings, but we basically install the tubing that goes between the CMA propulsion systems and the ESM, and also the environmental control and life support systems such as oxygen, nitrogen, and water. So all the, so all the commodities. We basically have to put jumper tubes in and install, install all of those. Okay. During the event, the clean room was also occupied by the Artemis II crew module, which was down to the final standalone welds. We've got three more welds that need to be done in the clean room, so it's going to come out next week. Out of the, it's going to come out next week out of the clean room, and it will return to the CM station. I think it's about two, two and a half months of installing all the electrical harnesses. Oh, that must suck, dude. Oh, that, that, that must take forever. Outside and inside, and installing all the avionics boxes, such as computers, power data units, and everything that, that goes with the command and data handling, the guidance, navigation, and control. All of that electronic installation and outfitting work is going to happen in the next two months. For a long time, as many as three years or more, were forecast between the missions now referred to as Artemis 1 and Artemis 2. Oop. However, a significant revision in the Exploration Systems Development Manifest in 2018, Jim, allowed the missions to be flown closer together. The chains also put Artemis 1 on the critical pathway for Artemis 2, and the Orion program advanced procurement of a second set of crew module avionics later in 2018 so that the assembly of the Artemis 2 spacecraft would not be significantly held up by Artemis 1. The full avionics set... The full avionics set is conceptually divided into core and non-core groups. Orion first decided to move... Up Orion first decided to move up procurement of the core avionics, and those computers and devices are at KSC ready for installation into the crew module. The decision was made to accelerate the core set that was going to be built for Artemis 3, so that the core was built earlier and it's going to be installed on Artemis 2. Be the reason why they're saying that, guys, is because Artemis 2 was originally supposed to reuse Artemis 1 components. 
So the components that you get back on the capsule at the end of the Artemis 1 mission, you they would take that apart and they would install it on Artemis 2 to save some cash. Uh, that that was the idea. Jim Jim said that's going to end up costing more money and just said make another set. Trying to get Orion's production going. That that was the intention there. Well, um, Hellfish, I don't know. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. I'm through being upset about this, dude. Like, just for what it's worth. I just I just make pudding jokes now. Uh, I'm, th I'm through being upset about this. It's just important to kind of learn and understand what's going on here. Uh, you know, I'm not necessarily on board with baselining Artemis 2 to 2024, but... You know... They're gonna... They're... they're 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 basically rebase they're rebase lining SLS and Orion right now, and the idea is that the idea is that it's gonna delay right now, but you'll be able to go faster later. That's the that's the intention here. Um, now I I don't know I'm not necessarily on board with that, but it it's not the worst idea. But also rebase lining a vehicle that's fully assembled and ready for a test flight doesn't seem like the wisest thing to do. But it seems like it seems like what Bill really wants to do is try and try and slowly but surely change the SLS Artemis program more to a constellation style architecture. And you know what, man? I don't hate that. I, d I don't hate that. I don't hate it. The problem is, is that doing that right now and shade changing in the direction of the program the further it is along in development is going to end up costing a lot more money and I'm just wondering where that money is going to come from but hey who knows maybe you know like maybe Bill Bill's probably banking on the infrastructure bill funding for NASA to be able to curtail some of those costs so hey maybe he has a trick up his sleeve I don't know what would constellation style mean for SLS uh, basically came here get the upper stage, get the EUS on the books, ready to go. And then once once the SLS is in the EUS configuration, then start really, really procuring a lot of stuff, uh, procuring a lot of, um, uh, that's when you basically start block buying. They basically said, we got to rethink a couple of things right now. So we're going to, we're going to wait until, you know, after Artemis three, right? to really start putting the SLS program into overdrive. Uh, once again, that's something I'm not necessarily... I, I, I don't... I don't think that's the right decision. My gut's telling me it's the, right, it's the wrong decision, but I really can't say why. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I don't think... I, I, I don't know, man. I, I still firmly believe without deadlines, you're really there's really nothing to scale to. That's the thing, you know. In order to keep, in order to keep this program kind of fiscally, you know, and you know I hate talking about like fiscal stuff, right? In order to keep it kind of, you know, to prevent like scope creep, you you really have to. We need to do this by this this date, and then we need to do this by this date, you know. Having deadlines like that gives you something to scale to, so it's easier to project the costs for the program. The problem is, you can say that we're going to go back to the moon tomorrow. How much is that going to cost? That's going to cost bajillions of freaking dollars to the point where you could throw so much. Elon Musk could throw his entire fortune at you know the Artemis program right now. You know if that was allowed. It's not allowed. You can't do that um, unless NASA explicitly states in law that you can. Uh, you know how many billions of dollars would it freaking take to get you know people to the moon by the end of this year? I, I like I honestly do don't think that that's even possible. Even like if NASA just let the taps go on all the engineering and said screw it, let's start making mass SLS cores and Aerojet Rocketdyne build a new factory for RS twenty fives to start mass producing them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I still think that you know that's you it's not. Like that, you, if you could throw like an extra ten billion dollars into NASA's budget for a human spaceflight, and you were able to delegate that correctly, I still don't think we'd be able to get to the like twenty twenty four would be realistic. You know, 
but yeah, I, I don't know. I, re baselining right now, I don't think is the wisest decision. But here's the thing: like, this re baselining could once again put NASA back into a more flexible architecture. So down the road, it, so like they spun off. NASA's exploration stuff. So NASA's like human spaceflight testing and, and engineering. They spun that off, G not not Jim. Bill spun that off into its separate thing. So spaceflight operations are different than the exploration budget. And spinning them off into two different things is not a bad idea. That's what we did during the Apollo program, for instance. That's what we did during the shuttle program, for instance. That, that's not a bad way to do things. The, the th my thing with this is is that this was the right thing to do in 2011 when they got rid of exploration systems development and merged it with human exploration operations to try and to try and save money or whatever like whatever that means yeah. but yeah I mean I don't know dude I where I'm at with SLS and Artemis is like I'm still hype on it Artemis 1 is going to be amazing but now, really, all that's left to do is, like, this is a problem that I can't change. It's totally out of my control. So it's just kind of let's understand, try to understand what they're doing and kind of go from there and just tell it like it be. I don't think so, Hellfish. No. I, I, it really smells like they're working out to sever SLS from everything else to make it go away. N no. No. I, I, I honestly don't think that's what's going on. There's zero reason for Artemis 2 to be two years after Artemis 1, Zip 0, Nada. What if Artemis 2 ends up flying with the exploration upper stage? What if they're rebaselining stuff? What if they're rebaselining stuff because they want Artemis 2 to be full SLS, so block 1B, not this piece of junk block 1 that we have with an upper the dinky upper stage. The US is at least 5 years out. Well, I don't know how you can say that with such conviction when they literally just said they're going to re-baseline SLS to, to, to do the opposite of that. Like Once again, it's about understanding. And Hellfish, for what it's worth, I don't... I think that flying Block 1 is just fine for now. I mean, Block 1, frankly, shouldn't exist, if you want my honest opinion. Block 1 should have been with the EUS. That cost-saving measure is going to cost us billions of dollars in, in extra systems development. Uh, you know... It's almost like they said we're going to save $30 billion, but we're going to spend it elsewhere and get less done for the same price, right? Like, hey, Procyon, what's up? It's amazing that Artemis 2 will be the first Orion with the environmental control and life support systems. That's waterfall testing, Kerbal. That's how they, that's how they work. That's the difference. That's the difference between how SpaceX does stuff and how NASA does stuff. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure how you could say that with such conviction all of a sudden. I mean, re hey, you, like, here's the thing, man. Rebaselining this thing might be the right idea. This is one of those things where my gut's telling me that it's probably... Uh, every time we rebaseline something like this, it ends up getting pushed out further. But maybe something is different this time. I don't know. I recognize Jim, Elon, and the Rocket Lab guy, so that's Peter Beck. So that's Das, he's a producer for NASA Space Flight. That's Jim. That's Gary Lai, he's uh, New Shepard's chief engineer. That's Wario. Tori Bruno, Peter Beck, and then over on the far right is Rocket Guy. He's a rocket scientist that streams Kerbal. Does the same kind of stuff that I do, builds launch pads and stuff. But see, like the thing is that Rocket Guy does that stuff in real life. So yeah, pretty cool. I don't know. I, I Guys, like, I understand what they're trying to do. I don't mind it. It's just that... How the space program works, how NASA works with their space programs, I always say it's kind of like running a steam engine. You know, I like trains, right? 
So what do you need to start a steam engine? Well, you need coal or something to make heat, heavy oil on a modern modern steam engine, right? So you need you need fuel oil and you need water, right? Those are the two things that you need. Okay. So you got to fill it up with all these commodities. You got to So first of all, you got to build the damn steam engine. And then you got to fill it up with all these commodities, right? You got to fill it up with a lot of water and a lot of oil. Right? And that's basically you know, when you fill it up with water and oil, all right, and the steam engine starts rolling down the tracks, that's when the space program, so it, it's all research and development up until that point, okay? And when the steam engine starts going, that's when you kind of hit the peak, okay? Now, steam engine builds up momentum, all right? You, you build up momentum. You got you to gotta keep the boiler, you got to keep the, the, you got to keep the boiler pressure high so you can move the piston so you can make the train go down the tracks, okay? It has a lot of momentum, all right? My thing with, uh, and that's that, that's basically what Jim was doing. Jim was building up the boiler pressure in an already existing steam engine, so to speak, and the train started moving down the tracks. What Bill is doing is, is basically saying, oh, I noticed that, you know, you filled it up with this amount of water. If we filled it up with this amount of water, the steam engine could go further later. So they basically stopped, stopped all the momentum, right? Drained all the water out, and then they're starting to refill it again. And that's going to take some time, right? Now, when you hit operations, when you're going to the moon routinely, that's when the steam engine is chugging down the track. But once again, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to get to that point. You've got to build up the steam. You got to you got to get all the commodities in. You got to start you got to start making everything work. And then once you're rolling, that's when you start moving towards operational missions. Once again, Bill stopped the steam engine because they thought of a they thought of a way that they could make the steam engine go faster later and go further. That's the idea. It's not a bad idea. But every time this has been implemented, every time you try to do that, every time you stop the steam engine, the steam engine ends up staying there a lot longer than you anticipated. Uh, not yet, Baralicious. It seems like perfect is the enemy of good hellfish, but once again, it, it could be the opposite of that. Perfect is the enemy of good right now could make you a better launch vehicle later. And like I said, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, dude. Every time we've, every time I've heard that before, every time we've heard that before from NASA in the past, the space program stagnates badly. They did that with the space shuttle. They did that with Constellation and then it got canceled and now they're doing it with SLS. I've heard this before, heard this, heard this story before. Uh, you know, but then again, history doesn't repeat. It rhymes. So, I don't know. Maybe it'll be different this time. You gotta stay optimistic, though. Why don't they ask for help from Elon? Elon's building the lunar lander for the Artemis program, Maverick. What more, what more help do they need? I can tell that Bill is much better than Jim for the agency. Yeah, he's more diplomatic with Congress and has more DC background. They can't cancel SLS, can they? Yeah, Procyon, I don't know. Bill seems to be very, very fluent in political science, which is good. I mean, he's been there for a very long time, which when he was nominated as administrator, when or when he was confirmed as administrator, excuse me, I, I, I said that, that that's a good idea because he's, he, he, you know, he, uh, he, he can, he, he can speak politics enough to be able to get stuff done, right? Jim could do the same thing, honestly. I think I think Jim could do the same thing, and I think Jim was a lot more diplomatic with this. Uh, but then again, I don't, you know, Jim was very straightforward about what he was doing and why. That's that's my big difference here. And let's be real, Jim was way better at press conferences than Bill was, like way better on the fundamental level. Uh, but another thing that Jim going for him, hey, do you have your own Discord? Sure, I do. 
Unfortunately, I'm a history nerd, so optimism, so optimism uh, of the cycle being changed is not a strong suit of mine. Yeah, well, I mean, if people weren't cynical about things, you know, people wouldn't regret everything down the road. Gotta keep your head up, dude. Can't just, can't just turn into a douche nozzle when freaking, when the chips are down, man. Look, I don't necessarily think this is a good idea. I hope that I'm wrong, but... One thing I'm not going to do is just sit here, like, I, dude, I, I, I'm done being angry at it, you know? Like, let's just figure out what's going on and go. Uh, Two spot. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. I fundamentally disagree, and I think you'll find that the proof is in the pudding. So, let's just... Figure out what's going on and kind of go from there. Well, you know, the... so that's what that's why I'm reading this article in the first place. Currently, Artemis One is projected to launch no earlier than mid-February. Launch during the February period would result in a nominal mission splashdown in late March. On the projected schedule, the earliest availability of the Artemis One equipment would be in the April time frame, which would be about the time when Artemis II, the Artemis II crew module is scheduled to begin its initial 10 to 12 week power up and function checks with the core set of avionics. This timeline could change, however, with an OIG report issued Monday, November 15th, noting that NASA will likely not be ready to fly Artemis I before summer of 2022. Oh, <sighs> Meanwhile, the newly mated service module for Artemis II will move into the clean room in mid-November for welding of its fluid connections. Following that, it will be moved into a proof test cell for leak checks on the now integrated service module fluid systems. We have the propulsion system and the environmental control system. These are our two main systems that we want to make sure are in healthy shape, and so we're going to take that to the net, take that to the max design pressure times 1.5 for a factor of safety. 1.54, I hope. We're ensuring the workmanship on both the CMA and the ESM are healthy, and then we put in a gas to check for leaks. Yeah, they're basically going to test the pressure vessel. Procyon, I, I noticed you're relatively new to the stream, and I think it's worth noting this. Look, there are folks out there that say that, you know, NASA shouldn't build their own rockets and they should buy services, right? Because commercialization is cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. Which, I, I honestly, that's really funny to me that, that, that that's what people think. So, t twofold. One, first and foremost, you can't beat the laws of physics. There's no cheaper way to have the characteristic energy on a rocket to land someone on the moon. That requires billions of dollars of development of a launch vehicle. Okay? The only thing that's going to make flying to the moon and having a lunar base more sustainable is economies of scale. Because think about it like this, okay? If it costs a billion dollars to build SLS's factory, right? And you launch two times a year, the price tag on an SLS rocket is going to be up here. If you use a billion dollars to build that rocket and you launch four times a year, well, the price per unit is going to go down because it takes so long to build the factory to make this dang vehicle that once you have the entire factory built, building the rockets is the easy part. Getting all the equipment engineered to build it, that's the expensive part. The, and the funny thing is, is that SpaceX is the same way. Does anybody here, can anybody sit here and tell me that they think Starship is going to cost $2 million a launch on its first launch? There's no way. Multi, Multi-billion dollars if you compound the cost the way that NASA does. It's going to get billions of dollars to do this orbital flight test that, that SpaceX wants to do. It's going to cost billions of dollars. They built the entire pad and the entire factory for the rocket in a field. And don't get me wrong, that's damn impressive. And I'm not saying that SpaceX couldn't in the future get down to $2 million. I hope they do, and I think they're going to. But at the end of the day you're still overlooking the fact that this is going to cost billions of dollars. Like, it doesn't matter if it's private or public. Now, Elon has problems with how NASA does things because NASA, for this exact reason, this is not sustainable. Launching once, twice a year to the moon, that's not sustainable. 
you, no, th that's not a good way to go into space, and that's not a good way to make humans multiplanetary. That's going to do it on a time scale that increases our... Uh, flying on this frequency is going to uh, increase our odds of being extinct by tenfold because it's going to take 50 years to get a moon base on the moon instead of 10, right? Because no one's willing to throw money at the problem except for him. Well, there are other people, but that, that's the idea. That's the criticism there. So, my thing with... I want... My thing with this is that we, we, NASA somehow thinks that, oh, we figured out how to go to the moon. We can do it for cheaper. Overlooking the fact that it's going to take billions of dollars to make a launch vehicle. It doesn't matter if you... If, it doesn't matter if we just blueprint copied the Saturn V right now if we could do that. It still costs billions of dollars. It's still a Saturn V. It's not like it's a... It's not like it's a simple piece of equipment. You're literally talking about something that has enough energy... That, that expends enough energy in scale with a low-yield atomic weapon. So, like, the amount of energy that a nuke gives off, a rocket gives off, but it's just out some nozzles at the bottom, and he uses that to go up into space, right? That's that's my thing here. That, that, that's the big thing. The only way that you're going to beat, you're, gonna, you're going to make, make spaceflight more sustainable, regardless if you have an expendable or a reusable vehicle, is economy of scale. Now, preferably, I think reusability is hedging your bets against sustainability, right? Because you can theoretically fly more if you make a reusable vehicle. It's, but either way is just as sustainable. So the, the idea that NASA can save money by doing this by, with the rocket and save money by doing this with the rocket, I've always found to be stupid. That's really absurd. But simultaneously at the same time, I think people saying that NASA shouldn't develop a rocket at all and they should use commercial, and this is the second reason here, is also a really stupid idea. It, the whole reason SpaceX exists in the first place is one, first and foremost, Elon Musk tried to buy an ICBM and the Russians said, no, that's stupid and laughed at him. And then he took that personally. Second of all, Elon Musk looked at the space shuttle and said, that's not sustainable at all. I can do it. F I can, I can do that for cheaper. I can make a rocket that can fly more than the space shuttle after a couple billion dollars in development, Falcon 9 block five, good example, economy of scale through reusability. There you go. The point that I'm getting at is that the reason why Falcon 9 exists is because the space shuttle existed and commercial companies said, that thing sucks. We can do it better. Now, what does that mean? So people see that in the near term. They see that and they go, oh, well, the commercial companies can do it better. Let's just use commercial for everything. Not fully realizing that if you go from an, a, wholly gov a wholly owned government space program, right? And you swing that pendulum over to a private space program, there's no datum for the private space program to look at and say, we can do it for cheaper. And without that, the prices get, the, the commercial industry will stagnate eventually. You have to have a healthy and robust national space program and a healthy and robust commercial space program working in uh a peaceful symbiotic relationship. So is that I mean, that's the right way to do this. That's why I, I always will be optimistic about NASA's programs. I think that people that say that, you know, we should just cancel it and pull our eggs into the commercial basket, that's gonna lead to stagnation too. You have to have a, com a healthy, robust environment here. And I think that in the future, NASA's goals and SpaceX goals are fundamentally different. SpaceX wants to make humans multiplanetary first and foremost, which I agree with. NASA wants to, NASA's there to pioneer developing technologies to be able to do that and to increase our scientific understanding to understand how humans came to be, to understand our place in the universe. The goals aren't necessarily at odds with each other, but differential goals like that require differential equipment, SLS versus Starship. So it's important to have two in redundancy because there are things that SpaceX can offer that NASA can't and vice versa. You you need you need to have both. You need to have you need to, NASA needs their own healthy and robust space program that's specifically tailored for scientific research purposes, albeit planetary science, Earth science, human exploration science, you know, Mars bases, science research facilities around the solar system. Hopefully, right. 
And then SpaceX to be able to provide, basically have the logistics, right? We're talking about like what NASA does and what SpaceX does is basically c comparing like, it, it's like comparing NASA's Sophia, right? To a 737. It's, it's not, NASA Sophia is a 747 that has an infrared telescope built in the back. It's specifically designed for high altitude infrared imaging of the stars, right? A 737 is specifically designed to move people around, right? They're, they're, they are the same thing, right? They're both passenger jets, but one of them is fundamentally retooled for a very different purpose. And now that's just airplanes. When we're talking about rockets, you need something completely different. When we're talking about doing science on the surface of the moon, it's not doing science at 30,000 feet. On the surface of the moon is gonna require a completely different architecture. But at the end of the day, economies of scale with both of these rockets is going to create more, st more sustainability. And that will A, help us increase scientific understanding in the universe, in our place in the solar system, which is pretty damn important. We should probably figure out why Mars is the way that it is so we don't end up that way, and why Venus is the way that it is so we also don't end up that way, right? And, uh, and B, simultaneously make humans multiplanetary. That's really, really important. You have to do all of those things. You can't just do one or the other. One or the other is gonna lead to stagnation. All commercial space program, that will lead to consolidation of the market and that'll lead to monopolies on space programs. Obviously, that's obviously the end goal there, right? How, how can it not be? Unless the government says, no, we need redundant dissimilar capability. But simultaneously at the same, at the same time, an all government space program historically has led to very bad stagnation in the space program. Once the U.S. government had no competitor in the space race, they dumped the Saturn V like a parking ticket and said, oh, yeah, do it for cheaper. Yeah, whatever. See what I'm talking about? It's an important thing to understand. So that's why, I, I mean, that's the reason why I like Jim so much because he wanted to get NASA back to, you know, launching rockets and doing it a lot because at the end of the day guys a politician can't make a law that makes going to the moon cheaper which they think that they can for some stupid reason which i find it that i find that hilarious that's the funny part like yep you know, we're we're gonna make a law that says that you know you only need five kilometers a second of delta v to get from the surface of earth to the surface of the moon <laughs> congratulations we we beat physics like <laughs> All right. <laughs> I get that. Often it's the federal government. Yeah, pretty much. Well, that, that's the other reason why NASA exists, to develop technologies that will eventually find their way into the commercial market. And then SpaceX took that idea to the next level. <laughs> you know, oh, Constellation doesn't make sense because, you know, it's underfunded. It's not technically feasible. Isn't it your job to make it technically feasible? I mean, budget? What do you mean budget? It's always going to be expensive. What are you talking about? Are Raptors feasible to put onto a Falcon? Uh, Maverick, anything is feasible if you're willing to throw enough money at it. Making a fully reusable two-stage-to-orbit launch vehicle that catches a, a 22-story first stage with a huge launch tower with catch arms on it is feasible if you're willing to throw enough money at that problem. You could put a Raptor engine onto Falcon. It, it, honestly, it would be overkill for the second stage. I wouldn't put it on the first stage. That, uh, I mean, you could. You could, but the, it's better to just freeze Falcon 9's architecture. Just let it do its thing. Falcon 9, that steamed engine is gone. It's going down the road and that steam engine is picking up speed and it's going down to the end of the line. And the end of the line, that's when the vehicle retires. I mean, NASA talks about this cost structural analysis in their technical studies book here in the in the systems engineering handbook. Um not technical studies. They talk about how program funding works. Uh, let me find let me find the graph. I'll show you.
Long story short, if you stop the steam engine after it's going, not a good idea. It's going to end up costing way more money because you have to fill the steam engine back up with everything, with all the commodities, and get going again. Space programs, like I said, they have momentum, and that momentum is very, very easy to just say, oh, you know, we, you know, we could just get that momentum back really easily. Every time we've done that, we've ended up with less momentum. Yeah. I agree, Came here. I, I don't think that putting raptors on it is a good idea. Is this handbook interesting reading if you're not an engineer? It helps you understand how NASA works and why they do things the way that they do. Uh, here we go. Look. Damn saturation. What this graph basically says is that once you get going, you're going. And the further you get down this timeline, the more the cost is going to be to get going again. That's basically what that says, like a steam engine. That's why I use a steam engine as an analogy. Why is that? Um, okay. Why is that? Okay. Uh, let me, Obertine, let me... Long story short, the momentum. It's a, it's a steam engine with the momentum. That That's a pretty good analogy. The new hairstyle is cool. Thank you. Thoughts on getting to the moon by solar electric propulsion. It would be... Okay, you traded out you traded out engines, engine efficiency and you sacked TWR. And now your ECLIS system needs to be able to sustain a crew mission to the moon that's going to take three months to get there. So how much more efficient is it? It's not. Uh, unless we could drastically scale up solar electric repulsion and hook SEP to a nuclear reactor or something, it's not worth the time. Sinerd. The Wario pick always cracks you up? Right on. Yeah, here. I'll, I'll show you the systems engineering book this way. I mean, Novus, am I, am I on par? Like... I'm trying not to let my distaste for this idea cloud my judgment. I think I think I think we're in the ballpark here with how this should work. There it is. Take a look for yourself. Yeah, Sinerd, maybe. I mean, NASA Systems Engineering Handbook. That's right. So, Obatine, think about this like building a house, okay? This is building a house. This is a better, this probably is better than the steam engine because people understand what it takes to make a house, all right? You need a foundation. You need to build the first floor. You need to build the stairs in the first floor. You need to wire it for all the electricity. You need to plumb it. Then you build your second floor and you do the same thing and then you build the roof and you put the tiles on the roof then you finish everything inside the house and then you're good to go okay long story short if you drop the blueprints for the house or, or no f formulate a concept draw up the blueprints right start sourcing the materials and start building the house and then you decide oh the second floor isn't really what i want let's change it now you're going backwards. Now you're going back to the development cycle. So repeat this. Go back over here. And if you go back over here, you already spent your money over here. So your funding ends up looking like this. If you look at the same graph, you start going up, right? And then you want to go back over here. Well, that doesn't mean that this money just goes back this way. Your budget ends up doing this. You basically start this over again. And then if you do it again, eh? and every time this graph dips in this direction, that's more money because you have to start over. You have to discard what you had. Every time we do this, every time we do this, it ends up costing more money and less gets done. It's better than if you just let the program go through its natural cycle. And it costs more time. Yep. Does that make sense?
Looking for page 13, I think. I got it. Yeah, I got you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Everest. So, one caveat is that it's typical for waterfall style management. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're building up momentum with that steam engine, and then if you stop, you got to start over here. You don't get to keep going from right here. It, for some reason, we think we can do that. And that's what I mean about, you know, oh, we're going to regulate against the laws of physics here. Like, um, it's not really how that works. If you want to build a rocket that goes to the moon, there's no cheaper way to do it. It's always going to cost billions of dollars to build a launch pad, to build an integration hangar, to do all the engineering, to build your blueprints. Start making the first floor. Start making the foundation. The launch pad is your foundation. The first stage is your first floor. Second stage is the second floor, you know? Like, it's going to take time. So, like, like I said, you know, basically when they when they took 2024 landing off the table, they do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. But they did that with the idea that operations down the road, you know, they started they moved back here with the idea that operations down the road would do wouldn't go up like this. It would be cheaper to operate it. That's the idea. But once again, if you did it at this point, you might as well just go back over here and start with something that you actually wanted in the first place instead of trying to trying to build a first floor on a cracked foundation. You know, it doesn't. But then again, you know, you don't want to start over. If we start over, if we kiss the moon goodbye in a couple of years. If they start, if they they build, if they re, you know, if they brought back Ares Five, for instance, right now, if we did that, moon ain't happening for another ten years, at least. Say they axed SLS right now, the whole thing, and they brought back Constellation, right? Ares 1, Ares 5, same exact plan. Guess what? Now you're going back to 2004 because you got to start over again. So that would be test flights in five years, operational missions after that, heavy lift testing in 10 years, operational missions to the, to the moon in 15. This is what I mean. Every time you go back... Your timeline gets pushed out even further. And this is true for any mission. This logic can be applied to anything. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. And once again, I'm not... If anybody's watching, I'm not harping on SpaceX. I'm a, I'm a big SpaceX fan. I love what they do. They're doing it right. NASA should, be, NASA should be doing the same thing, is what I'm trying to say. So, let's take a mission like Europa Clipper. All right? So, Europa Clipper... Europa Clipper made it past CDR right here. They went through all of this. Eh, eh, eh. They made it to the CDR and they started building flight test hardware. And then NASA decided to fly it on Falcon Heavy instead of SLS. <whistles> and now, because we saved cost on the launch vehicle, seemingly, seemingly, because we save cost on the launch vehicle, SLS, you know, would be because the infrequency of flight, right? It would cost a lot of money. That's not, that's true. That's absolutely true. Economies of scale is the only way to bring the price down. So that's true. Falcon Heavy would have, <clears throat> Falcon Heavy would have been less. Even if you compare price per launch to price per launch, Falcon Heavy would be less all the way. Now consider this. This is what I mean about regulating against physics, which is stupid. Falcon Heavy is going to take five times the amount of time to get out to Europa, to send Europa Clipper to Europa, than SLS would have. That's five times the life cycle of, the space pro of this program. So now your operations, which account for over 50% of your budget, because you started back over here, now you're, now you're stuck behind, and then operations through disposal is going to be five times as long. So... Your operations cost is gonna is gonna go like this over time. It's gonna go exponentially up, and it it could. It's not. I'm not. I can't speak with certainty because I can't pr predict the future. But it, it, it theoretically could because the spacecraft is gonna take five times as long to get there because we decided to save some cash with a launch vehicle. It's gonna cost five times as much money in operations. I can think of another satellite right now that has the same that that suffers from the same fate. You know what it's called? James Webb Space Telescope. You know how many times they reset? They hit the reset button on James Webb? 
Nine billion dollars over 20 years. See what I'm talking about here? Europa Clipper is going to end up costing billions of extra dollars because of all the operations costs. They're up there. You, you have five times as much operations cost. It's going to cost billions of dollars more than what originally was. Even, you know, even if we saved $700 million by launching on Falcon Heavy, you think, you think that five times the amount of operational length is worth $7 million? No way. <laughs> Not a chance. Look at it. Look at this graph. Look at this graph. Cumulative percentage of life cycle cost against time. Longer the time goes, it's parabolic. Steeper this gets. Five times as much operations, which accounts for 50% of the budget. You're extending that five times. It's going to cost five times as much. Actually, more than that because it's exponential. See what I'm talking about? There's things that I notice with NASA that's just not the way to do things. And once again, I, I, this isn't a harp on SpaceX. SpaceX will take the contract and they'll like it and they'll use that to develop a rocket that's more sustainable so they can actually beat the sustainability problem in space with economies of scale because Elon Musk knows what he's doing. And, but once again, at the same time, that's not to say that NASA doesn't know what they're doing. I'm sure there's there's many a thousands of engineers at NASA also that also want to do the same thing, but they can't. Do you have any numbers for the operational costs of NASA flagship missions? Billions of dollars seems rough. Not off the top of my head, came here. My running, my running comparison is James Webb. But, see, came here. The, the funny thing is, is that James Webb, James Webb has cost ridiculous amounts of money because they keep hitting the reset button. So when James Webb eventually goes to operations and development, the, 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 the operations will go through the roof too. It'll end up costing way more. But New Horizons post-launch operations were under $80 million for year, per year. Well, Europa Clipper is a little more complicated than New Horizons is, don't you think? It's, a, it's an orbiter. It's not flyby. So it's more complicated spacecraft. Something like that, Tessa. Mm-hmm. That cost will have to be discussed at some point, right? I would love to be able to throw these numbers in the face when that happens. Well, Blue, I can't predict the future. The simultaneous thing to my argument is that I can't prove any more that it's going to cost five times as much over time than I can prove that Falcon Heavy is going to end up saving us money. It could be one or the other. Once again, can't predict the future. I don't really know what you're alluding to that was changed on SLS and Artemis. What dictated that schedule delay? They re-baselined SLS. At least that's what they said, Novus. They, they went for a rebaseline for SLS to make it more sustainable down the road. Basically prep it for a block buy in like five years or something, from, from what I understand. That's why I was so annoyed with, with, with Bill and Jim Free the other day. Uh, because they seemingly want to rebaseline SLS. Am, am, I, am I mistaken? Did I, did I misunderstand that? Because if I misunderstood that, then there's no problem here. You going to Lurik Obatine? Sure. Okay, cool. Does that did that make sense, dude? What does that mean, rebaseline? Rebaseline means go. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. It means go over here and redesign some things to better fit what you want to do. <laughs> Tessa, of course. You are right that cost goes up over a longer journey to an orbital mission, but it would be negligible compared to the cost of the orbital mission, which would have A, B, be unchanged, or B, be reduced in length because the craft lifetime was lost on the journey to Europa. To Europa. Okay, James, so let's, let's pick that one apart. Uh, all right, so A, the orbital mission, which would be A, unchanged. So, yeah, th what the thing's going to end up doing when it gets out there is, not, is, is, is the same. But what happens, James, what happens if the spacecraft does a spirit and opportunity? And it just works well beyond what it was designed for. Then what? So would it be reduced in length because a craft lifetime was lost on the journey to Europa? Yeah, it's possible. So, okay, the net result is NASA gets less science. So great, we saved a lot of money and we got less science because of it. 
which goes back to a fundamental theory that I'm telling you. There's no way you can regulate against physics. You can't, you can't, you can't say, oh, I can do it for cheaper when the amount of energy that you need to send something somewhere and the amount of science yield that you can get, which is dependent on time, right, makes a difference. What? That's like saying, oh, I can get from New York to Los Angeles for a lot cheaper if I invented a teleporter. And James, that goes back to a, 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 the, the, once again, it goes back to a fundamental thing that I'm talking about. What's NASA's job here? Is NASA's job to save money or is NASA's job to generate scientific understanding? Because if its job was to generate more, to, to get a higher scientific yield from a mission, you'd, you'd want to pay the extra money for SLS because you get what you pay for because you can't beat physics. <laughs> no amount of dollars can throw, no, you can't throw any amount of dollars at a physics problem and solve it. Like, oh, I don't want Newton's third law to exist. I have billions of dollars. I'm going to spend this so we can violate the third law of, si uh, third law of physics. Like, eh, mm, not how that works. Well, you could. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure you're right, though. Though scientists and project engineers are paid based on project, I'm 90% sure that the, this, as a government employee in a different agency, let me see, Blue. I bill my hours based on which project I'm actively working on. Should be the same for them. Project costs will definitely increase. It's a zero-sum game, Blue. The only way to straight beat this problem is to fly more, fly rockets more. And once again, Elon Musk, uh, Elon Musk understands that. He gets it. I don't know why NASA doesn't either. They did it in the 60s. They, they proved that problem right in the 60s. Gravity, man. It's not. It's just not a good idea. It's the law. Yeah, all right, Novus, let me see your last. Okay. Uh, but you implied something changed that caused the delay. I don't think I've heard the thing that caused the delay if there's a thing. Well, okay, so my understanding is that they moved Artemis 2 to 2024, and Artemis 3 is net 2025. They did that citing a rebaseline of SLS, and in that same press interview, Bill proceeded to make a bunch of excuses because of COVID, uh, because of cost, because they didn't get the budget that they asked for, and because of Jeff Bezos, uh, because of the Blue Origins litigation against NASA in the Court of Federal Claims. And, and then on top of all that, he proceeded to throw Jim under the bus and say that his plans weren't technically feasible, which I... So... I mean, no, that's what pissed me off. He just blamed everybody but himself. That, like, dude, you run NASA. How can you blame everybody else? You're six months in. Like, you're going to blame... He threw Jim under the bus. He said Jim's plan... Jim and his boss's plans for NASA weren't technically feasible. You know, we can't do this. We can't do that. COVID this. Litigation that. Rebaselining this. Rebaselining that. Uh, okay. So if you want to rebaseline it, you should be able to give us relative concrete dates here, right? Based off of operational cost, production, testing, and development. You should be able to you should be able to predict when the lunar lander will be up and running on a pretty reasonable scale. But no, he didn't do that. He gave himself an out. So what did they change? They rebaselined something. Is it possible for Bill to be right? Spot yeah, of course. Of course he's right. But Spachu is saying saying that you have poor performance because of COVID, right? Is like saying, oh, I can't do my job because it's raining out. I'm pretty sure everybody has to deal with the rain too. Everybody else has to deal with it. So if it's everybody's problem, it's nobody's problem. Stop making excuses. But yeah, Novus, I'll have to look more into what was exactly rebaselined. I'm I'm interested to see. So I, I don't know. Well, if your job is baseball, yep. <laughs> so, Seinert, my point is, is that if you're dealing with the same problem that every other business and every other organization is dealing with, is it really a problem? Like, why even mention it? Just devil's advocate, but what if Jim's plans were unfeasible and powdered for Rule 8 reason? And then Bill's saying, yeah, we just can't do all this far-sighted stuff. <laughs> uh. 
Hang on, I lost my train of thought, Phil. What were you saying? Just devil's advocate. What if gym stuff was unfeasible? Why was it unfeasible? Technically unfeasible? What does that mean? What do you mean technically unfeasible? You're NASA. It's your job to make it feasible. I'm a chef at a restaurant. I can't do my job because it's raining out. All right. I can't cook food because it's raining. Oh, all right. Are you unclear? Shoot, Blue. Yeah, let's get some clarification there. Of course, Jim's... Po <laughs> Yeah, the other th the other thing the other thing to understand is yeah of course 2024 wasn't wasn't doable the moon wasn't doable in the 60s until it was Elon's half of Elon's goals aren't technically feasible he still makes them anyway because you drive towards something. Discovery, go at throttle up. Megan, 16-month resub. Thanks, man. Did he mean unfeasible in the timeline? Yeah, duh. Yeah, uh, of course. You, you, I mean, guys, even if Jim was still there, do you do you think we'd get to the moon in 2024? Uh, probably not. Yeah, yeah, probably not. But we might get and get there in 2025. Wouldn't have a problem with that. Just like how I don't have a problem that SLS was moved to 2022 because they had to fit it. They had to fix some things. No problem. At least we're here. Right? It's better than nothing. Right? Like, so now, because we said it's no earlier than 2025, it's 2020, 2024 ain't happening. 2025 ain't happening either. It's going to be like 2026, 2027, more realistically. You, people make deadlines in the aerospace industry all the time. You never hit deadlines in the aerospace industry. That never happens. But you, you know, if you have more ambitious deadlines, you could theoretically get more done. The Apollo program literally proves this, and so does SpaceX. It doesn't matter if it's a commercial entity or a government entity. The point still stands. How should you handle the meeting when you have bad news but don't want to cast blame? Take ownership of the problem and fix it. It's your job to fix these problems, not blame other people. That's gross. Look, they could have said, hey, we have all the same problems that everybody else has. You know, we have this problem, but we're NASA. We can do it. We can solve these problems. It might take us a little bit longer, but we're going to take these problems head on. We're going to take the bull by the horns and we're going to get it done. Because we're NASA. We can do things. It's our job to make it technically feasible. Because we need to do that, we're going to rebaseline a couple of things. We're going to reestablish new deadlines. 2024 for Artemis 2. 2025 for the Lunar Lander. Uh, 2025 for the Lunar Lander. Boom. Done. Easy. That's all you had to say. So the rebase line is to take an original schedule with original activity durations and basically reset the schedule so it doesn't show you as being number of X days behind schedule. This is typically done when schedules get largely behind. Okay. Okay. Notice I get upset at the random offhanded comments, but I don't really understand being upset at the rebaselining if we don't know what was actually rebaseline. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, I'll give you that one. That's fair. It makes sense to me that there would be programmatic changes as SLS moves forward from development to operations. Fair point. Uh, yeah, sure. That's that's right. Uh, but m everything that Bill said that cast blame that he cast blame for. Apollo isn't really that comparable. Weren't they getting the equivalent of nine times the funding that NASA's getting now? I'm sure, Baralicious, but that nine, nine times that funding was to A, figure out how to do it, and B, build all the facilities that you need. The Artemis program already has the VAB to use. So yeah, of course it's going to be cheaper this time around. Sorry for repeating my question, but wouldn't it make more sense that NASA... Yeah, that's basically what Bill did. He spun off he spun off exploration systems development a la carte into its own directorate, which is yeah, they that's basically what they did. 
Can we do some interviews with some general NASA folks to get details? Seems like we're Yeah, I mean, if we don't know what the rebaseline is, I suppose, I suppose, you know, I'll concede that one. That's fair. Yeah, I, yeah. Like I said, look, I'm not. My gut's telling me that this is not the right move, but that's just your gut. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Once again, I'm just. There's historical precedence there with that. That that's why that's why I don't like this idea, but. I said at the beginning of this that, you know, I'm done being angry about it. I'm just trying to understand what's going on. That's it. You know, if we let emotions guide us like that, you know, especially with NASA, you're going to get somebody killed. <laughs> like, let's be real. So, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I can see the point that, you know, not knowing what the rebaseline is means you're getting mad about nothing. Yeah, that's probably right. No, but what... That's fair. What pissed me off is making excuses. I don't like that. It's not a good look for NASA to blame other people for why NASA isn't doing better. I, I really didn't like that. That really, really it just left a sick taste in my mouth, dude. But I'll, I'll have to go research what the rebaseline is. I, I, that's, that's barking up the wrong tree. I'll give you that one. You know, and once again, fellas, I'll say this, and you know, I'm not, I'm not immune to this. It's hard to, it, it, it's hard to remove emotional attachment from from judgment here because I care a lot about NASA, like that. It, but it's tough to separate those two. Sometimes you got to look at it, you know, you, you got to remove that component. I think you put on a mean interview. Yeah, Spotch, maybe. Feelings make you weak, young paddle. Well, emotions cloud your judgment, dude. That's that's absolutely a thing that happens. And once again, fellas, I, I the other thing to mention, I said that I could be wrong. I could be wrong in this. Bill could be right. In fact, it would be kind of foolish to think that I know better. You know what I mean? That's the other thing. Like, I, guys, this isn't about being right or being wrong. I, I, I just, and I have no, I, I have no problem admitting if I'm wrong. I hope, I, I see what Bill's trying to do, and I get it. I, I actually kind of agree with it, to be honest with you. It, it, I'll be honest, it's mostly the excuses part that I really didn't like. That really, really didn't sit right with me. Because, you know, once again, this, this is just... You know, social interaction, I guess. You're making excuses now. What's going to be the excuse when China lands on the moon before you? You know what I mean? Blaming people is not a good look. And maybe that's what's pissing me off. But, and maybe taking away 2024, rescinding that is hard truth, but truth nonetheless. Yeah, Bill stated facts. You aren't wrong to dislike. I mean, good mood. Uh, James, he may have done it for a reason. Bill wouldn't be the one to just go and make excuses for no reason. He's been in politics way too long. I'm pretty sure it was calculated. It was a calculated move. If I'm willing to give Jim the benefit of the doubt with the HLS down select, saying he, he selected SpaceX to piss everybody off to get NASA more money, I wouldn't throw it past Bill to start throwing people under the bus to get more funding for his space program. That makes sense in my head. You know, you gotta you, you gotta look at it equal, right? Uh, roundabout, uh, we're talking just talking about SLS and whatnot. I think this is his money play. Well, if that's what he's doing, James, I give him credit, man. He has way more foresight than I ever could. <laughs> I hope that's what's going on. Yeah, floating exactly. Interesting, Spotch, interesting. 
Anyway, Negan with a 16 month resub in there. Thanks, dudes. I, I appreciate it. Artemis 2 and Artemis 3 got delayed? Yeah. That's the announcement. NASA NASA took 2024 off the table. Saying it's not... They basically said, hey, it's not realistic. And they said, we're going to do Artemis 2 in 2024. And then Artemis 3 landing on the moon is sometime in 2025. Net 2025. Basically, it didn't didn't give us any concrete any concrete dates. Instead of keeping all this money to so-called private companies, they should keep it in house. It's not one or the other, Bizak. You should do both of those things. You want you, you want to you want to be more sustainable in space. Have a healthy healthy government program and a healthy commercial program. Simple as that. Twenty twenty four didn't have any concrete concrete dates. So dot dot dot. I mean. What just December thirty first, twenty twenty four. There's your there's your deadline. They also give zero reasons why Artemis two would be in twenty twenty four. Well COVID basically. And guys, in the scheme of things, right, Artemis two was supposed to be in twenty twenty three. And Bill did cite a seven month delay in litigation for the lander, so now they have to scale around the lander, right? If Artemis 3 isn't going to be ready in Artemis if Artemis 3 isn't going to be ready until 2025 because the you know the Court of Federal Claims prolonged the lander, right? Because because Blue Origin, right? And they had to deal with 7 months of litigation. Well, that's 7 months that that's 7 months of stopping the steam engine. You didn't have a choice there. You know what I mean? Once again, like this is the other side of this argument. Like like, look, it's delayed for... Everything is delayed basically by seven months because we're starting right now. You know? More food for thought. I didn't really see the same worry when they re-baselined the Artemis 1 SLS core to change up the manufacturing flow, joining the ES horizontally. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Yeah, that's true. You're right. You're right. That There you go. There's a re-baselining that actually made stuff happen faster. I like having these conversations, guys. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I like I like doing this, even though it seems like I'm rehashing the same stuff over and over again. Somebody from chat always brings a new perspective, and I can factor that into my judgment to get a better data set on what's going on. It helps with analyzation. This is more more an exercise for me than anything. You know, that it, no, that's a good idea. And once again, I see what they're trying to do. I get it. Splitting EDS... And, and this is this wasn't announced in the press interview. Splitting ex, splitting into F, exploration systems development and HEOMD, reverting back to how how human exploration operations and exploration systems development were structured during the Constellation program is a good idea. I was not happy with that initially, and then I realized what was going on, and I agree with that. I would have done the same thing. Dead serious. That's a good idea. Jim was very clear about how it would affect the schedule, though. Yeah, that's true. That's another good point. Ah, yeah, screw it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wish the, with you on that one, too. Hmm. And, yeah, like, basically it goes back to what I said at the beginning of this discussion. Look, I'm not happy with moving the, moving the dates back. I'm not happy with it. I understand why that's going on. It makes perfect sense. But, you know... It's not worth getting. It's not worth getting pissed off about, right? It's not worth. It's not worth getting too pissed off about. Like, seven months is not that big of a deal at the end of the day. It, it, and once again, restructuring NASA the way that they did is not a bad idea. That restructuring NASA in this way allows them to do more rapid iterative testing. So this might be the right path for SLS in the long run. And NASA seems to think so. So that's not a bad that's not a bad idea. If these companies are worth billions of dollars, they shouldn't need funding. NASA should just share the research that the taxpayers pay for. Well, Bizoc A, they do that already. And B, NASA isn't paying them 
for they're not giving them funding they're not investing in spacex they're paying them for a service differences also you should read in the table next to the page after the page in that graph it's got some good rules for trade-off when it comes to cost it's on the page before the graph all right let me take a look let's read let's read let's learn let's understand Natch, I'm officially a 737 pilot. Hey, congratulations, dude. Okay, the system engine, the systems engineer's dilemma. At each cost-effective solution, to reduce cost at constant risk, performance must be reduced. To reduce risk at constant cost, performance must be reduced. To reduce cost at constant performance, higher risks must be accepted. To reduce risk at constant performance, higher risks also must be ex accepted. Interesting. Well, I mean, okay. No, but in a nutshell, this is demonstrating risk adversity versus, you know, high performance, uh, like mission success, right? Like, so we're talking about waterfall versus agile, right? That's, that's what we're going on here and finding a happy medium between those two. Figure 251 shows that the life cycle cost of a program or project tend to get locked in early in design and development. The cost, cost curves clearly show that late identifications of and fixes, fixes to problems cost considerably more later in the life cycle. That's what I've been saying. Conversely, descopes taken later versus earlier in the project life cycle, project life cycle result in reduced cost savings. Okay, it's the triangle of risk, performance, and cost. Got it. This figure obtained from the Defense Acquisition University is an example of how these costs are determined by the early concepts and designs. The numbers will vary from project to project, but the general shape of the curves and the message they send will be similar. For example, the figure shows that, that during design, only about 15% of the cost might be expended, but the design itself will commit 75% of the life cycle cost. This is because the way the system is designed will determine how expensive it will be to test, test, manufacture, integrate, operate, and sustain. If these factors have not been considered during design, they pose significant cost risks later in the life cycle. Also, note that the cost to change the design increases as you get later in the life cycle. If the project waits until verification to do any type of testing or analysis, any problems found will have a significant cost impact to reduce, to redesign and re-verify. Yep. So, okay, Melvis, let's, let's go with this. Would it be fair to say that if we're measuring this on a spectrum here, so you have high risk over here, right? And then you have low cost over here, right? That like where Jim is on this graph and where Bill is on this graph is close to each other but one is slightly moved in one direction or another, right? They're close, but we're shifted in one direction versus one other direction. Am I thinking about that correctly? If we're gonna graph like Jim and where he stands of like risk aversion versus cost, and then Bill risk aversion versus cost, like if we're gonna put this on a spectrum here, they're close to each other, but one's like this way or one's that way. Am I thinking about that right? But if you make something fast and good, wouldn't it become less risky and cheap? The problem is, Tomast, is that when you're going to the moon, that's an inherently complicated thing. There's no simple way to do it. You can't beat physics. It's always going to be complicated. Always. But where were they on the graph in the 60s? They were way towards risk 
They were way on the risk side of things, guys. The Apollo program was super dangerous. Super dangerous. Apollo 8, dangerous mission. Uh, plug out testing with the Apollo capsule killed three people. Very dangerous. I'd say that's probably fair. It's about tolerance for the amount of risk that you're willing to accept. So I'd say Jim has higher risk aversion or lower risk aversion comparatively to Bill, and hence this shift. Not up, not a big shift, but a shift nonetheless. It's king of like, it's kind of like the old saying, if it's fast and cheap, it won't be good. If it's cheap and good, it won't be fast. If it's fast and good, it won't be cheap. Yeah. You know? Now, Melvis, here's where my mind's going to go. Where's SpaceX on this graph? Right? Where do you think SpaceX is? Like, where's Elon on this on this risk aversion graph? SpaceX has deep pockets. Something, yeah, well, spot us. That's something. That, that, once again, SpaceX can do it for cheap, but they can do it for less money. But they throw millions of dollars into development to be able to do it for less money. There's still a funding hurdle that you have to overcome. No matter if you want to make costs for a launch vehicle down to like two million dollars a flight. Or if you want to build a launch vehicle that flies infrequently and goes to the moon, you still need to spend billions of dollars to make it. It doesn't matter what it doesn't matter. Leaning on the risky side of things. You know, like I said, this isn't anything that we really didn't know, but it's good to rehash this stuff from time to time. I don't really know. We don't really have insight into their cost, hence your apples to oranges talk earlier. Yeah, you can't yeah, you can't compare price you can't compare price to launch until cost involved. That's like It's not even comparing meters a second to feet per second, dude. You're comparing meters a second to inches. It's like mm, alright. I don't know, Novus. I guess I guess me personally is more is is less risk adverse. Like I don't, dude. Put an SLS on the pad. You know it's gonna get at least. You know it's gonna at least get off the pad. Just fly the stupid thing. But then again, you know that doesn't look very good on the books, right? Like I, I get that. NASA can't be seen failing. SpaceX doesn't really matter. So I think NASA has to take risk aversion a lot more seriously. But once again, the way to unshackle NASA from that risk aversion is to make a deadline. Get back to the moon in 2024. That's a way for NASA to allow more risk. But it is it, all, it also at the same time is allowing more risk. Yeah, you know, was, uh, get back to what I said. At the end of the day, is, I guess there's no use being being pissed off. Just understand where they're going and wish and hope for the best. You know, like there's no there's no really need being cynical about it. But man, dude, dude hearing that hearing NASA make excuses, dude, I can't like just from an emotional side of things. That really pissed me off. I wouldn't do that. You know, when the SSTO blow blew up on the pad, I took ownership of that problem. I screwed up. I figured out the fault tree. I figured out that it was my fault for getting antsy about installing a mod and then uninstalling it. And the leftover crap from uninstalling that mod broke my SSTO. Like, like that's my fault. That's nobody's fault but mine. You know, I won't say, oh, well, it's the mod's fault. Or, oh, it's chat's funding because chat didn't give me enough money. Like, ew. But then again, you know, like, once again, that NASA can get away with that. 
Couldn't you just revert to an older save? Peg, my, my rules, my rules for the save is no reverts. Schedule crunches can also backfire pretty badly. That's another good point. Like in some of your mission mode saves, you've had to, you've got to have a balance of ambition and realism. <laughs> the point of mission mode is to teach chat where the balance lies. <laughs> oh man, did I come up with a good rule set there? Wow, that's really realistic. <laughs> I know, three soul, I know, I'm so sorry. I screwed it up so bad, dude. It's my fault, man, I screwed up. I I tried to do something the easier way and the easy path ended up nipping me in the butt, dude. Where did I get this cup? I have no idea around about it was a Christmas present, believe it or not. What mods caused problems, the docking port the docking port drift fix caused the pad to work in a weird way. Not because I integrated when I had the mod installed, but I uninstalled the mod. And that mod left leftover data that were in the docking ports. Uh, basically, yeah, Kerbal got really confused during integration and I didn't see it until the last second and then it blew up in my face. Yeah, like I said, I understand the problem. I understand what happened. I understand the behavior, and I understand the failure, the failure mode, and the fault tree. Like, guys, we could launch the big SSTO right now, and I could get it into space if I had the cash. But that's that's the reason why I put freedom back into the folds. Sarkozy, wasn't that mod made by one of the KSP devs too? Yeah, of course. It was made by Repo, KSP1's lead developer, JPL. And this is not his fault either. The mod is supposed to fix things. It's not his fault. Like, he he made... Repo made that mod because people were complaining. I never complained about docking port drift, but I let chat talk me into installing the mod to try and get the, the SSTO working faster. I didn't like the behavior of how vehicles interacted with that mod installed. When I uninstalled it, there was leftover stuff from that mod in the code of the docking ports, and it screwed up the docking ports, and that's why it blew up. <laughs> that's my fault. Look, Chad didn't put a gun to my head and say install this mod. I did it willingly. That's my fault. You know? Hey, Ismic, what's going on? But yeah, Novus, thanks for... <laughs> Thanks for helping me tailor this out, dude. It's, you know, it's a, it's good to understand. It's a good exercise. It's a good exercise in understeer, uh, understanding the engineering dilemmas and risk aversion that that Bill is willing to take versus Jim. That's a really good thing. It's a really good thing to understand. And I appreciate it, dude. Thank you very much. Sorry for being a dick. <laughs> like seriously, it's just it's, my bad, man. <laughs> it's my fault. It's my fault. You sure? It feels like we do that sometimes. As long as you learn and learn from the failure, I suppose nothing's wrong. That was the point of mission mode, Blue, to teach you guys what it what it takes. This is hard, man. Space is difficult. Nobody ever says why space is difficult, though. Mission mode gives you some insight into why this stuff is so ridiculously freaking complicated. Sure, it's a difference in philosophy. Each have their pros and cons. Yeah, and Nova's. I mean, I already said it, dude. Like, look, I like th this. Is not a bad thing to do. Splitting up NASA's exploration systems development is a good idea. And uh, I I'll, I agree with Bill, and I agree with Jim Free, and I agree with Kathy Leaders in that regard. That's a good idea. We'll see. We'll see if it has its benefits. I'm hoping it does, and I think it will. You know? But also, at the same time, you know, it's shown that it might not. But, hey, I can't predict the future, dude. It's a good idea, but it comes down to execution. And yeah, that's what the, like what, once again, man. It, 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 once again, this is me kind of letting my emotions in. Making all those excuses, right? It's not a good look for it. That, that, I'll be honest with you. It doesn't instill high confidence in me for them to be able to execute correctly. If you're gonna make excuses now, you're gonna make excuses later. Take it from somebody that made a lot of excuses in school to justify in their mind why doing homework was a waste of time. But then again, Bill ain't a freaking 15-year-old. He's, you know, like, it's, 
just important to do this kind of these these kind of brain crunches, I guess. Yeah, floating. That's what I mean. It's that's my fault, dude. It's my fault. I'm not I'm not blaming anybody for the SSDO blowing up on the pad. You guys had nothing to do with it. That was that was that was me. Bill's not a 15 year old. Yeah, but if you have a habit of making excuses, you're gonna stay in that habit. Take it from somebody that made a lot of excuses. You know, like that doesn't instill high confidence, to be honest. But I will be very happy to be proven wrong. Anyway, you guys want to see what's going on with Starship? Oh, also, Pritchow launched this morning. Check this out. Look at this track, dude. Oh, oh baby. Mm. I don't hate that. I gotta head out for a bit. Have a good stream if I'm not back later. No, but thank you. Thank you for thank you for helping me. Thank you for helping me get understand this stuff, dude. I appreciate it. It's 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 good to get a it's good to get a pulse and get a bigger data set like that. That's that's right. That's the right move. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. It, your your insight in there in here helps me a lot more than you might think. It really does. I'm serious about that. Yeah, that's right, Buck. Mm -hmm. Tim Dodd released the Vernier vid or the Soviet rocket video today. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So that was Pritchell launched this morning. Uh, I was up for that launch, and that's why I was a little late to the stream today. Um, so Rocket Lab also has an announcement on December 2nd here. Check this out. Mark your calendars. A major neutron development update is on the way. All right. What, what do we got here? Earlier this year, I ate my hat. There's some things we said we'd never do. We're going to build a big rocket. It's called Neutron. We've been busy. I've heard things about Neutron, dudes, that, uh... I've heard things about Neutron that are pretty freaking cool, to be honest. Uh, those things that I've heard include propulsive landing, and once again, this isn't, I, I didn't hear this from a guy who knows a guy, I actually don't know anybody that works at Rocket Lab, to be honest with you. Uh, this is just from Rocket Lab saying things in their press interviews, you know. I've heard that Neutron is going to propulsively land, Falcon 9 style, and it's going to be human rated, which is... Happy. Finally decided to switch all my streaming stuff back to normal OBS rather than open source solutions after using Streamlabs for way too long. Nice. Do you know how many orbits that progress is going to do before docking to the station? Uh, uh, Thursday, I think, is when progress leaves, and I think Pritchell's docked Friday, so 90-minute orbital period at that altitude, username, over the course of a couple of days. Do the math. Directly compete with SpaceX? I'm not exactly sure, Sir Sav. All right, what I'd miss in space news... Uh, we had a discussion about SLS risk aversion. <laughs> Basically, so... That's cool. All right. RTLS from Mars will be interesting if they go that route. So, yeah, that's what's going on with Rocket Lab, and now... Here's the big NSF video. I wanted to show you guys video of that quick disconnect arm. Check this out. Uh, yeah, here. Take a look. This footage is coming from NASA space flight. Let's see what we got here. Uh, Make sure you go over and support NSF, guys. Once again, they give me basically unrestricted access to these videos to show on stream. That's that's freaking huge. Please please go over there and support them. Please do it. Uh, you know, supporting them over there will allow me to keep doing my thing here. So if you enjoy the analyzation that I that I put in, go go over and support NASA Spaceflight, please. This footage is taken uh, by Book Giga Gal. So so Mary, uh, 
and Nick and Sweeney uh, of uh, 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 for NASA Space Flight. So make sure you go over there, support them. If you can, please, please do it. Trust me on that one. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it unless I absolutely meant it. You know how I feel about advertising for other people. You think Neutron will launch from Wallops? That's what I've heard, Lundprod, yeah. Well, not that's what I've heard. They said they they said that. Peter Beck said that in a press interview that it's going to launch from Wallops. I don't know where. I thought that, I, if I'm recalling correctly, they said they're going to launch it from Antares' pad, which, okay. Because it's like almost the same size and shape as Antares from, from what I surmised, but I'm not sure. New jig outside of the tent, so I wonder what that's about. Hell, Hydra, that's correct. Is there such a thing as referral codes for YouTube membership? Nah, I don't need anything like that, Foz. Just go over and support them if you can. Are these holding clamps? I'm not 100% sure what we're looking at here. I don't think this is a jig for something, fellas, to be honest with you. Okay, so how do I know? Well, the jigs that they're using to help to move Starship around, anytime they make a negative jig, guys, they make it out of steel. See? Like this. Now, this is steel right here, but whatever these pedal things are, that's stainless. I don't really, I don't recall offhand them ever making a stainless steel jig for something. So, I'm not sure what this is for. This looks like they're gonna. This is a way to be able to attach these vein, the these stringers, I guess. Did Rocket Lab release more neutron renders on December second? They're gonna have a big announcement and a big update, RJ. It's also tack welded, right? Exactly. And then there's the uh, quick disconnect hood. I mean, that is a chunky piece of steel. Jeez. Yeah, there you go, Hydra, right on. Oh, man, look at that thing. Will the neutron rocket from Rocket Lab do an entry burn? I don't know, Tomas. I don't even know what the thing is made out of. I have no idea, dude. 21 is coming along nicely, Miles. She looks good. She looks real good. Like I said, the tile pattern on this thing is super freaking uniform. Super uniform. It looks a lot better than even 20, to be honest with you. It's kind of cool seeing that with 15 and 16 in the background, huh? You need a big launch pad to do that. That looks like painter's tape, guys. Those tiles look to be glued. And they're holding them in with painter's tape to let the glue set. That's just, an, uh, just speculation, though. I'm not sure. Bird. Yeah, El Hydra, it's crazy, right? What, you don't want 99 Raptors launching at the same time? <sighs> yeah. yeah. Ooh, nice SS Silverado. There's a Chevy I could get behind right there, that thing behind the logo. 
Not bad, not bad. Where's my 95 flare side, though? Where's that truck? I want that truck back. I'll take that over that thing. Will you make a starship down the road? Maybe. I've made it. I've made a starship in the past, RJ, in engineering mode. Yeah. I, the problem is I don't know how we're going to build a payload bay for that thing, dude. How are we going to do that? Honest question. I don't know. Might have once been Painter State, now it's Space State. Bird, nice Mustang. Yeah, barrel. See, that's a yeah, that blue. That blue, a nice car, boy. I tell you what. Bird, Ram. Junk. Ram. Hey. Dirt. Moving dirt around. Thoughts on Ford's new EV truck? I like the Lightning, not Nick. I think it's cool. There it is. There's my step side. Yes. Yes. There's that 95 flare side. That is a cool truck, boy. I don't see any Chevys from the same from 95 driving around on this construction site. Damn. Damn, boy. Look at that thing. That's cool, man. Look at that cool little truck. What do you think about the lightning front frunk drain? I, yeah, I like the Ford username. Like, what else do you want? I think that's cool. I think Ford really put some thought into it when they made that when they made their first EV truck. That's a good idea. With that being said, I want that one over there. Yeah, I, I'll take the I'll take the step side. That is a cool truck, man. Yeah, why would I risk damaging better trucks when I can just throw the old junk at the construction yard instead? Yeah, typical Chevy owner. Yeah, the Chevy stays in the driveway where it belongs and the Ford actually does work. I see how it is. Yeah, Buck. <laughs> I do like the Lightning. I think it, I think it's really nice. Hey, not Nick gifted five subs. Get Thanks, man. No one throttle up. Found a bottle. Oh, jeez, Dragon. Yeah, crazy. Then use flags to make a working payload. You can make a payload bay by attaching an open-ended fairing on a piston and then just retract the piston in the body of the starship to open the payload bay. Yeah, whatever. Oh, hi, Spoon. What's new with you? Mods, except I don't use mods, yet you recently broke your own rules. Okay, Maverick. Yeah, that's right. And I paid for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not blaming anybody. Yeah, that's my fault. Bro, I broke my own rules and I paid for it. I don't know. What, like, what do you... Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure what... I'm not sure what, you, what you're getting at, but yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, RJ, I, I suppose that could work. That might confuse people, though, dude. Part of the reason why I try to make stuff so accurate is so, so I can... All demonstrate a fundamental understanding of how Discovery, stuff works. No if I have, if I do the retractable payload bay, blah, 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 that means basically every time I deploy a payload, I have to explain that this is not how Starship will work. We don't know how Starship will work, etc., etc. I'm not sure if I'm on board for that. Hey, Vega, eight month resub. I'm teasing you. How the hell am I supposed to tell that from text, Maverick? Jesus. Do me a solid and put a kappa after it or something, man. Damn. Yeah, Hellhydra. We talked about that yesterday. N no, kappa. You guys are the worst. So you remember that car with the coolant leak yesterday? Well, it turns out the customer poured oil into the coolant. V 
they poured oil into the radiator. Stream chat, it didn't give me the behavior that I was looking for. Oil transfers heat as well. Uh, I, I know, Da Vinci. Yeah, you're right. Now, oil is a coolant as well. So, yeah, guys, I, by that logic, you know, like, let's pouring, pouring oil into the radiator on your $120,000 Mercedes is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Right, Sawyer? that guy installing? Hold on. What? What is, what is this? What are these things? I personally use Gatorade to cool my car. Oh, car's got to have electrolytes, right? What are, what are these things right here? Wouldn't plasma get into those spaces in the tiles? The tiles have a little bit of spacing, Bizoc, to take into account thermal expansion that happens from entry heating. Long story short, when Starship's going through re-entry heating, those gaps will, because the Starship expands, because it's being heated by plasma, it expands and the tiles butt up against each other. That's why there's little tiny seams in between each tile. It's to take into account thermal expansion. Y yeah, if, the, if it went through re-entry with... I mean, the space shuttle did the same thing for what it's worth. If it went through re-entry and all these were perfectly butted up against each other, they would all pop off during re-entry. Yeah, you don't want that. Bad idea. Zoom in. It's a YouTube video. That guy has some kind of wires attached to this thing. I don't know if that's... Yeah, that's very strange. Maybe it's... I don't think it's a sensor or anything, but it seems to only be on this one that the guy is working on right there. Can they calculate how much the ship expands? Sure, of course you can. Yeah, why wouldn't? Why couldn't they? I flush the system four times and replace hoses. About a thousand dollar job. Yikes. Huh. I don't know. Just asking for ignorance. Yeah, you secret. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Like, so, sorry, it's it's tough for me to tell inflection from text. Like, there's two ways that you could say that. Uh, like, say, oh, can't they just calculate how much the heat expands? Or wait, can they calculate that? I actually don't know. Like, see what I'm saying? Like, sometimes, sometimes I get it wrong. I try to try my best to get it right. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, you absolutely can do that. That's called finite element analysis. So. This isn't probably the this is this probably isn't the way that SpaceX does it, but okay, let's think about it like this. You want to figure out how much stainless steel expands and contracts, right? Uh, when it's going through thermal transients, right? So when it's going from hot from cold to hot during reentry and back to cold. So what do you do? Hit it with a blowtorch. Seriously, hit it with a blowtorch. Measure how measure how big it is when. You know, when, when it's fully heated up, when the thing starts glowing, right? Measure the length, and then when you let it cool off, measure the length again and see if it's the same as when you started, right? If you could do that with, like, a square foot of stainless, right? You you know, Starship has a much bigger surface area. You just figure out the surface area of Starship and kind of go from there. But, one, SpaceX probably isn't doing it that way. They probably did some material analysis on stainless at some point. Two, they probably proved that analysis with a simulation. 
And three, they they proved it triple redundant style with um, with in-flight testing, right? They're, I mean, secret part of the reason why SpaceX went from doing those suborbital hops like this right here to going to a straight orbital test, I believe is because they need to figure out if those tiles work or not. And that has to do with how the ship is going to expand and contract. Even Elon says it's very unlikely it's going to make it through re-entry. But it's going to fail, but you're going to be able to physically see where and why it failed, right? Which is not a bad way to do things. It's just very cost costly. SN20 is probably expensive. It looks expensive. Not warranty because the customer is a derp. Yeah. But yeah, the, yeah, secret, sure. Yeah, you could calculate that. I'll bet you that SpaceX probably has that, probably took that into account. Um, you got to do stuff like that. You got to take it into account. Did you cover SpaceX losing three of their VPs? Uh, first I'm hearing of that anesthesis. Whoa. Hey, not Nick, thanks. That's 50 bucks. Thank you. Here, this is to soothe your pain from chat. Scotch or whiskey? I like whiskey, man. I'm a whiskey kind of guy. But I don't, it, honestly, I don't really drink that much. I don't have time, dude. <laughs> but like, honestly, like, that's the, that's the, that was honest kind of thing. Any, seriously, anytime you see me drink, it's usually on stream when I have a beer during racing. <laughs> that's the extent of my drink. I'm not very social. I don't really go anywhere. <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate it. There, <laughs> New Year's, yeah, that was the one exception. Oh. More importantly, how do you spell whiskey with an E at the end or with no E at the end? I don't really care. I care more about the contents of the drink than what it's called. Oh, secret code. With five subs. Thank you. Yeah, XBZ, it's the hot dog is a sandwich argument. It's needless compartmentalization. Why are we arguing what a hot dog is? You're overlooking the point. You get to eat a hot dog. Hot dogs are delicious. I don't care what it's called. Oh, 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 oh. Flare side. <laughs> hey. It's mine. Go away. No. You can't have that. Well, I have something better than that spoon, but it doesn't mean that I don't want it. Man, SN21 is almost finished, huh? kind of crazy dude I want to see 20 and 21 like next to each other that would make me really happy so when are we fixing the diff in the F-250 maybe down the road flare side F-250 long box best of both worlds did they make a flare side long box mile is that a thing I think you'd have to make one yourself I don't think they did I don't think they did a flare side long bed for that year of truck I do like trucks, hard to beat that. I mean, so I'm not gonna lie, if I had a 97 GMC 2500, like a Sierra 2500, I, I mean, I'd be I'd be on board with that too. That'd be pretty good, with a 454 in it. I'd be really cool. Down the road, is in on the side of the road, yeah. So you put a cap after that goose, so I understand that you're kidding. Thank you. Yeah, more stairs, this thing, look at this thing. Look at that, look at that umbilical plate. That is like nothing we've ever seen. We looked at the pictures of this yesterday. And that thing has more in common with a docking port than it does a freaking carrier umbilical. It looks like a squiddy, right? So check this out, dudes. Look, 
you have pilot dowels out here, right? And these are on actuators, so they actually move back and forth. And then you have a you have your main alignment system here in the form of what these things that look like four trailer hitches that are attached to the side of this umbilical. And then you have hard capture hooks. We discussed this yesterday. Now, this really doesn't look, there's not many umbilicals that have a hard capture hook like that. Like, like SLS's umbilicals don't necessarily work like this. They're designed to actually de just detach, right? But there's pilot dowels here a retraction mechanism, and then a hard capture mechanism here. So this thing has more in common with a freaking docking port than anything. And that got me thinking, you know, if that umbilical works more like a, looks more like a docking port and seems to function more like a docking port, I can think of several reasons why having uh, an umbilical that works more like a docking port would probably be a good idea. I mean, chat basically didn't skip a beat on this. On-orbit refueling. Duh. But also, what I, I thought of another thing, too. If they want to be able to turn around Starship very quickly, the umbilicals need to be able to automatically reattach to the spaceship when they stack it, when the Starship gets restacked. So, like, say in some crazy parallel universe, they do... Th well, not parallel universe, maybe in the near future, they do this... Starship flips, the catcher arms catch the thing, and they just put it right down. The docking port is going to need to be able to reattach. It's going to need to, you're going to have to. You're going to have to have to, you're going to have to have to have to have to. You're going to have to basically be able to turn it around quickly. Umbilicals right now, you need a crane. Not a crane, you need to basically move it back into position and have people refit the umbilical and relatch the thing down. Having an umbilical that works like a docking works like a docking port is twofold, twofold good for SpaceX for on-orbit refueling and being able to turn around Starship quickly. I'm willing to bet that Starship's future on-orbit umbilicals are probably going to end up looking like this. I, I I think that's a reasonable thing to assume. Is that to counter the extra pressure of fueling such a large vessel quickly? That's my guess, man. Yeah, Smirks, that's true. They're, seriously, they're trailer hitches. How are those not trailer hitches? Now, the key, the thing is, is that how does this thing automatically reattach? But the risk of the umbilical not releasing increases? I mean, it's possible. Apocalypsis, I'm not going to sit here and say that SpaceX hasn't dragged, a, dragged an umbilical from the launch pad into space before. That's definitely happened. They took a dragon umbilical on one of the early CRS missions into space with them. Didn't detach, and it snapped the line, and they took the umbilical all the way into space. True story. I forget which launch it was, but that's definitely happened. It hasn't happened in a very long time, though. The, yeah, my guess is that this would be detached before Starship gets close to liftoff. Similar to a strongback retract, but that's just me. Because the whole quick disconnect arm can't be near that thing when it goes to launch, so they're going to have to retract and detach it and then move it out of the way and then, once again, like the crew access arm or the strong back. Was it still attached when it landed? I actually don't know. Maybe? I, I would assume probably not. And here are the final labels for the quick disconnect on the ship. Let me see. Let's check this out. Helium spare locks pre-pressurization, CH4 pre-pressurization, gaseous nitrogen fill and drain, helium fill and drain, CH4 igniter system fill and drain, High voltage, liquid oxygen igniter fill and drain, quick disconnect arm locking hooks. Yeah, see? Yeah, there's the, this is Starship's umbilical. This is, this is on 20. It looks like this. CH4 ground bleed. So that's for the, that's for the recondenser. Interstage purge. Interstage purge? 
Interstage purge. Quick disconnect arm alignment pin sockets. Interstage purge. I understand what everything else here does except for that one. What's the voltage level here? I don't know. I don't know, plate. My I'm going to go ahead and venture a guess. This is a huge guess, and I'm pulling this out of my tail, so I have no idea. The Starship sounds like it runs on 24 volts. Most aviation and most, most spacecraft run on a 24-volt system. Uh, but it could be 36. It could be 12, for all we know. Like, blowing gas out of the interstage? Well, what, what, inter, what interstage are we talking about here? Oh, we're talking about the area underneath Starship that's connected to Super Heavy. Because the, the engines do vent in there. You're going to need to create a positive pressure. The, the Space Shuttle external tank and the SLS core stage do something similar to that. they they got to prevent hydrogen from pooling in the inner tank and the inner stage. So, well, pr primarily the inner tank, not so much the inner stage. But yeah, okay, okay. Okay, it seems like they'll create a vacuum inside of the interstage to be able to pull gaseous oxygen out. Similar to like the beanie cap uh, on the space shuttle. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Most aircraft are 115 volts at 400 hertz. I'll default to your judgment, Da Vinci. I'll bet you, it, I mean, high voltage, like, that's what, I, yeah, see, that doesn't make any sense, what I just said. Because if it's 24 volt, 24 volt is nothing. That's not high voltage at all. So you're probably right. I'll bet you it's, I'll bet you it's up 150. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. It's, it's probably, it's probably way higher than that. Yeah, like, it has to be. Like, what, it has to be higher than that. Why would they put high voltage on it if it was 24 volts? It doesn't make any sense. I don't know, Stealthy. What does Tesla run at? Yeah, somebody said before Da Vinci that it's probably Tesla derived. Yeah, you're probably not wrong. It's also interesting how there's a dedicated port for controlling the flight termination system. Wait, what? Flight termination system inductive inhibitor sends a signal to arm and disarm the FTS. Huh. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. I, I suppose you would probably want that on its own redundant system. That, that makes a lot of sense. Hmm. There's the autogenous pressurization lines right there. There's the vent. That's the RCS. I don't think that... I think... Fellas, that they're gonna do away with the hot gas thrusters and just vent the tank for attitude control. Autogenous. Autogenous. Not Nick. Meaning that Raptor engines, there's a gas tap off on the Raptor engines that keep the methane tank pressurized. They're using gaseous methane and gaseous oxygen to keep the tanks uh, at high pressure while it drains fuel. Space Shuttle does the same thing with the RS 25s, believe it or not. See this thing work continues on the chopstick. So we got a hinge there. Hinge there. That's interesting. I don't like your attitude control. Yeah, Nick. Hey, just keep it classy for me, man. Okay. There's an actuator there, so this thing seems to pivot up. I don't know if Thomas is here, but I, I'm not exactly sure what this thing is for. It's some kind of stabilizer on the bottom of the chopsticks, but I'm not sure what, I mean, presumably this thing looks like it moves 90 degrees up into position right here, right? And then the top of the chopstick is way up there. So what, like the difference between where this is and where the top of the chopsticks are is like maybe 10, 15 feet or something. What's 10, 15 feet down super heavy that this thing will attach to? 
Uh, I'm genuinely curious. Like, I'd assume it's probably on the sides, 10 to 15 feet down from where the pin is on the on Super Heavy, and that's in the next shot. I think it's to lock the chopsticks together during a lift. That's actually not a bad idea, Wolfman. Because there's the pin for supposedly holding Super Heavy, and there's the grid fins. So the chopstick would be right here, presumably, right? And then that where that connection is would be down here somewhere. I mean that it's very possible that this isn't on there because the you know they're not catching this booster but who knows maybe they come down after the catch to help stabilize the booster actually I I think I think Wolfman you might be right when they're lifting you don't want the arms to do this right you need them to stay close to each other so that might be for lifting operations that might not even be for this What's to stop them from running fuel and oxygen in the repressurization system after lighting it as the RCS? What's to stop them from, what's to stop them running fuel and oxygen from the repressurization system and lighting it as the RCS? Complication? Elon talked about that in Tim Tim's interview with him. Oh, well that's good, Alex. All right. Yeah, Wolfman, I think you're right. To be honest, I think I think you're correct. There's the oxygen repressurization system. One, two, three, and then there's another one on the exact opposite side. Man, this thing's an absolute tank. Unbelievable. Do you think the US government is making another SR-71? It's possible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, probably, RJ. For what? I don't know. If I knew, I wouldn't tell you. Interesting. There seems to be some thermal insulation there. This, it's funny, that kind of looks like the same kind of, it looks like spray-on foam insulation. It looks like the orange from the external tank. Yeah, see, they're tapping into the autogenous pressurization systems. That's probably to keep the tanks in a stable pressure. See that? They got these two fuel hoses here. I wonder what those are about. Thing. Starting to look more spacecrafty every day. Vent lines right there, no doubt. Crazy. I was thinking this the other day. You should do Russian Duolingo streams once in a while. You've been talking about learning Russian for a while. I'm trying to learn the alphabet right now. I learn, I do a lot of learning off stream, hypersonic, but yeah. Maybe. So many good games coming out right now. I don't know if I have time. <laughs> like, dude, simultaneously right now, I want to play Hearts of Iron. I want to play Satisfactory. I want to play KSP. Uh, what else? There, There's more. Uh, uh, we, we reinstalled Flight Simulator. I want to play that. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> there's cities. There's summer car. Yeah, like, I don't know what to do, man. <laughs> There's Icarus when that comes out. I'm freaking screwed, man. Oh, what are they tearing up? But wait, there's more. Yeah, right. Oh, looks like he got some drones surveying the uh, the dynamic test stand. Look at these. Look at them drones. Starbase at some point, dude. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Bulldozer. Right, it's a front end loader, it's not a bulldozer. I, I, I know. Shh. Stationeers, dude. Creation, they're, uh, they're redoing. Stationeers is redoing its multiplayer netcode. They're re optimizing it from the ground up. If Stationeers, for instance, is using, like, Icarus's net, net optimizations, 
Oh, man. Yep, that's going to make Stationeers real fun. Because the multiplayer before, didn't it didn't really like multiplayer. Like, maybe four or five people at best. But if we can get a lot of people in, say, like, we do a community server in Stationeers, that would be insane. I would, I would have us make cities on Mars. Yeah, I, I would do that. That'd be amazing. Part of the real multiplayer principle, different game engine for Maker S. Gotcha. 500 people, something like that, not Nick. Yeah, that would be really fun. We would make barracks. I, I would make I'd make cities and I'd, we'd make apartment blocks and stationeers. And I, have had, I would have people do HVAC and stuff. Like we'd design the systems and somebody would do HVAC, another person would do electrical. We'd have building codes and stuff. And then that'd be, dude, that'd be fun, man. Elon's Twitch is up and he's talking stuff. Elon's Twitch. Whatever happened to the MC server? I was just not here on Saturday, Neo. The MC server, people are working on it right now. Tig's finished the airport terminal and it looks fantastic. I'm going to check it again on the weekend. Uh, Drill Bucket is working on the Coast Guard barracks here and the Coast Guard base, which is going to be pretty sick when that's done. We got DV that worked on the German consulate building there from Miami, which is cool. Lundprod's working on a huge office building right here in a parking garage. I'm not sure who's doing the who's doing what with this thing, but that's still really cool. Um, we got Sanchez building right there. It still needs to do a little bit of an interior for it. K3 built a tower over here. Flatiron building's almost done. Kickning built this office tower that's in Phoenix. Um, hi, Brimo. Hi. What's up? Can you fix... I can't get this in. I can never get the stupid thing in. I don't have the patience today. The Roomba? What are we trying to do here? I'm just trying to put this stupid thing back in. Error. He's not dead, he just needs a, br a brush change and I'm don't want to deal with it right now. Nice spoon. I didn't break it. I didn't. How would I have broken it? Is it not your hair stuck inside of the brushes? It ain't my hair. I don't There's have no any hair. proof of that, considering our hair is about the same color. The likely story. Like, I know it'll fit in there, it just isn't. Yeah, yours, your hair is the one that's fallen out. Somebody in chat said that. I love you. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, Fanta, and the rest of chat, too. <laughs> Let's see, and then this one. Oh, well, that one. There's stuff stuck in the pilot hole for this thing. Hair. This square peg, guys, is not, uh, doesn't fit in there. It needs to be filed down just a little bit. You think that I can give you a new bra a different brush? No, it's it's just the cast from this. Can you? Uh, can I get you a different brush? Because there's another one in the closet. Sure, if you want. Okay. It's not. It's not gonna make a difference. <laughs> you got it. Hold on. Yep. I got it. Yeah, just you needed. Did it. 
Just needed some persuasion. Where's the retaining uh, plate here? Oh, I put it back. It's outside. I can put it back okay, on. There you go. Yeah, nice I got it. Bib. Bye, Chad. Happy Thanksgiving. Now there's all vacuum poo poo on all the desert. All right. Hey, thanks for the bits, not Nick. I appreciate it. All right. So yeah, people are working on the Minecraft server all the time. I just didn't play it over the weekend because I, I had some family stuff to do. Family, 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 family. Now you need to tell us your, your Roomba's name? Apollo. What? Calling it Shuttle isn't a good name. The Minecraft city looks neat. Please turn it into a massive pixel art style poster and let us buy it. Oh, all right. That's not a bad idea. Look at that damn flex pipe, man. That thing is huge, boy. Okay. Cool. Good video. That's a lot of nuts. I think that's everything for Space News, guys. Um... looking through and making sure I got everything. Piece of advice, avoid Stellaris, okay. Will do. The Pentagon stands up, new identified aerial phenomenon group as Congress pushes for even more action, okay. This isn't really space news, but all right. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Tessa. <laughs> far too addictive? Oh, I know. Oh, I know. Uh, we have enough games, dudes. 